Hello and welcome to our Today All Day Pride special, Pride is Universal, Better Together. I'm Joe Fryer. In the next half hour, we're going to highlight stories affecting the LGBTQ community, stories of hope, healing, and inspiring individuals making this world a more inclusive place. We begin in Memphis with the story of Kayla Gore. While homelessness is a national issue, finding safe shelter can be difficult, especially for transgender individuals. Kayla's organization is hoping to change that by building houses and putting more than a roof over the heads of those in need. Take a look. It's a city known for its barbecue and blues, but just minutes from the hustle and bustle of Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee is also home to a vibrant yet vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. We're in the Bible Belt of the South, and it's a, it's a red state in terms of housing access and discrimination, employment access and discrimination. There's no real legal protections for trans people. Nationally, one in five trans individuals is said to have experienced homelessness at some point in their life, and nearly a third live in poverty. Those figures are even higher when you account for race. I was born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. When Kayla Gore was just 23 and newly transitioning, she experienced homelessness while living 1,500 miles from the city where she grew up. It was very, very scary. After returning to Memphis, she entered a transitional housing program and began working without Memphis, the local LGBTQ community center. During that time, Kayla says she started to see a lot of trans and queer people kicked out of their homes at the age of 18, some rejected by their families. While there are services for individuals experiencing home insecurity in Memphis, many are faith-based. There's lots of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, and more importantly, a lot of those shelters are separated by sex assigned at birth. You're forced into a situation of either outing yourself or staying closeted in an environment where you could be incredibly unsafe. There's also a lot of trans folks of color here, so then you also kind of double down with racism. They have a lot stacked up against them. The pandemic exacerbated that. A survey by the Trevor Project found last year more than 80% of trans and non-binary youth said COVID-19 led to a more stressful living situation. Hoping to change that, Kayla, who'd been able to purchase her own home, which she shared with others who found themselves experiencing homelessness, founded My Sister's House. We wanted to provide like a space where people can thrive and they can actually start to grow um, and heal the trauma that they had you know, experienced in their youth. Originally a word of mouth program, my sister's house aimed to provide emergency services and shelter to trans and queer people of color. It's for us by us, like it's trans people at the helm of it and it's from a perspective of someone who's been there. I was homeless as a youth, so I, I remember what it was like being vulnerable. As my sister's house evolved, so did their mission. Now the group is aiming to build 20 homes for trans women in Memphis. It's safe to say that I did not come from a background of building houses or working with plumbing and electrical, uh, but it is safe to say that I came from a family that had really love and compassion for the community that they live in. Originally planning to build tiny homes, they're now renovating existing homes because of the rising costs of everything, including lumber. Using a lottery of individuals they previously helped, recipients get more than a shelter, they actually own the house. It's a different feeling when you um, have your own place. Jeanette Adams moved into her home just a few months ago. It's a tiny house, but it, you know, it's big to me. Jeanette had been living with her mom and has a supportive family, but being able to live on her own has boosted her confidence. I felt free. A lot of people, especially trans women, we don't get a chance to own anything. Kayla says that's exactly what she's hoping to provide those selected to receive a house. Trans people are boxed out of economics in so many different ways that we have to build our own economics. This is how people built generational wealth 100 years ago where their families had small homes. So it's nothing new that we're doing. It's just that we're doing a unique thing for a community that really deserves it. Just a couple miles from Jeanette's home, crews are replacing the electrical system at another property. This will be our fifth house that will be occupied. Modi James will soon call this two bedroom home her own sanctuary. I'm ecstatic about it because it would be mine. It's my, it would be my home, not my house. Modi says she does not feel safe in her current living arrangement. I've been trying to get a home on my own. They take you to the ringer and they expensive. I see nothing and I live nothing but poverty. I'm trying to overcome it. 
LGBTQ advocates in Memphis say my sister's house is giving people more than a place to live. It also created visibility and hope and inspiration for the trans community and for trans people of color here in the South that just wasn't there before. If I had the opportunity to receive the resources that we provide today, I couldn't imagine what my life would be like. Kayla hopes to expand and replicate what my sister's house has done in other cities. She also hopes the program has something of an expiration date. I would want the legacy of my sister's house to be that we came, we conquered, and we disappeared because we no longer were needed. My sister's house operates mostly through donations and grants. A GoFundMe for the group has generated more than $300,000. Kayla says they have a goal to build and renovate 20 homes by the end of next year. Coming up, Craig chats with the sole openly gay professional baseball player in the league. Plus, this cattle ranch has become a social media sensation for its grass-fed beef and the queer farmers behind the brand. Stay with us. Baseball, America's favorite pastime. We might sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, but it's a profession that only has one out player, Brian Ruby. Craig recently caught up with Brian to hear about his experiences as a gay professional baseball player and how his dad's support has made all the difference. Take a look. Meet Brian Ruby, the only openly gay professional baseball player in the United States. Brian first came out publicly last season while playing independent baseball for the Salem Kaiser Volcanoes in Oregon. I decided that I'd come out to my teammates last season by lacing up with rainbow shoelaces during Pride Month. I considered it more like inviting in than coming out. Yep, this is who I am. You threw me one curveball. Brian's dad, John, whose last name the family would like to keep private, was Brian's high school baseball coach and, as to be expected, has always been his son's biggest fan. When did you know that Brian was going to be a baseball player? Something clicked around six or seven and he got passionate about baseball and we were always on the baseball field. John had some success of his own on the diamond, playing Division I ball as a pitcher at the University of Pennsylvania and then overseas in Australia. That experience led him to have some initial fears about his son's baseball career when Brian shared his plans to go public about his sexuality. In your heart of hearts, did you think it would change his opportunities? I was worried about how he would be perceived in that world. There were a million things running through my mind but what I wanted him to know in that moment was, I'm good, and you're good. And he wasn't just good, he was great. After tying up his rainbow laces and coming out to his teammates and the public overall, Brian's batting average skyrocketed a full 90 points. So what was it like last season? Well, I don't know if I'm gonna get applauded when I run onto the field or if 
I'm going to be in the batter's box and get hit by a 93 mile an hour fastball in the head. The real thing that happened was I got a hit, you know, my first at bat and got on base and the pitcher tipped his cap and I just gave him a little tip back and that peer-to-peer on-field recognition was by far the most meaningful thing in the game of baseball. And Brian's not only talking openly about his own story, he's also co-founder of Proud to Be in Baseball, an organization that supports and advocates for ball players of all ages who are looking for game mentors in the sport. Brian's work with Proud to Be in Baseball has taken him around the country to attend Pride events at a number of MLB ballparks. In September of 2021, he was invited to sing the national anthem at Dodger Stadium. Oh, say can you see. In addition to being a, 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 quite, the, quite the baseball player, you're a, you're a budding country music star. All the best things come out of left field when you are who you are and do what you I always loved country music. And uh, I've been writing songs. I always have my guitar on the road during baseball, playing on the team bus. I mean, which do you enjoy more, baseball or, or country music? <laughs> I gotta be careful because the baseball coach is. I don't know, you're good. <laughs> you're good. It sounds like you're it's good. neck and neck. Look, you can only be a baseball player for so long. It's true. I would imagine, Dad, you have to be quite proud. What I'm most proud about with Brian in general is he just goes for it. I mean, what do you want to see from your kids? You want to see them thrive. Yeah, I mean, you know that's a testament to good parenting, too. Uh, I mean, that's what I hear. When we come back, the spotlight is on LGBTQ youth and the generational shift of coming out in this digital world. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now we focus on the future and the advances the next generation is making when it comes to coming out. I sat down with five students at the University of Central Florida to hear about their experiences with coming out. Take a look. They're called Gen Z, but many young adults proudly embrace five other letters, LGBTQ. I'm a lesbian. I'm gay. I'm bisexual. I'm transgender. I'm queer. A recent Gallup poll found that among Gen Z adults, those between the ages of 18 and 25, about 21% identify as LGBTQ. 21%, it's one in five. When you heard that number, what was your reaction? I really wasn't surprised. Our generation isn't really scared to actually say that we're part of the community and we're actually proud of who we are. 
With the help of Campus Pride, a national group supporting LGBTQ college students, we gathered this group of Gen Zers, Eddie, Nick, Marcus, Sierra, and Mary. They go to the University of Central Florida and are part of the first generation to totally grow up in a digital world. Social media, how important was that to you when you were younger? Oh, social media, it was like everything to me because it really helped me form a sense of myself. I remember writing in my diary as a kid that I had a crush on a boy just over and over and over just to pray that eventually I'll convince myself that I do. And I got introduced to these online communities and I finally saw, oh wait, I'm not a freak. There are people out there who feel the same way that I do. And that realization saved my life. And I don't want to add more stress to your day, but I love you. They could also see themselves reflected in traditional media, movies, and TV shows. Growing up and seeing even the smallest bits of representation in like LGBTQ plus characters and everything of that sort is just made me feel, you know, like not alone. And it made me feel like kind of understood. And perhaps no endorsement had a greater impact than the one delivered by the Supreme Court in 2015. Now to that historic Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage across the land. All of it creates a sense of belonging that mental health experts say is vital. The messaging that Gen Zers have is like it's okay to be who you are and to love who you love and to talk about that and celebrate that. A majority of LGBTQ Gen Zers say they're bisexual, and among those five letters, a growing number of young people identify as queer, which is perhaps most simply defined as not straight. I present as a boy, but I love pink or I love like feminine things, but at the same time, I could also like masculine things, and I don't need to be in that set, like binary. For your generation, it's easier to come out than, say, my generation. But it's not easy, is it? No, no definitely not. Mm -hmm. For me, coming out was always sort of like bouncing off a brick wall and bouncing off the brick wall and bouncing and bouncing until eventually I can make a dent. I feel like there's this huge disconnect. Oh, being queer is like a trend, but these are people's identities. These are people really putting themselves on the line and putting themselves in a place where they could be in danger. All of them grew up in more conservative communities in Florida. It's a state that's making headlines this year for passing legislation that prohibits classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity for many younger students. We're gonna make sure that parents are able to send their kid to kindergarten without having some of this stuff injected into their school curriculum. What critics call the don't say gay law. Now you're just trying to control and minimize us and just kind of shove us back even more, but I think it only just kind of makes us push back harder. So when you look at the future, do you have optimism? Yes, definitely. We have always been here and now we are saying we're here. We are letting the world know that we accept ourselves, we love ourselves, and we're not going to back down. One major reason it's easier for younger people to come out, society is more accepting. 70% of Americans now approve of same-sex marriage. And here's a really important stat about acceptance. LGBTQ youth who have at least one accepting adult in their lives were 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt. According to Harvard's Life in Rural America surveys, less than 5% of the rural population identifies as LGBTQ. But Bastrop Cattle Company is working to change that. The grass-fed beef brand has taken TikTok by storm, amassing millions of views and likes about their grass-fed beef while influencing a new generation of farmers within the ranching community. Take a look. The first video that I made ended up going viral for about 9 million views on TikTok. And it's just me yelling at cows. Normally me being sassy with them because some of them are just real troublemakers. Girls! Come on, girls! I did not expect that people would be so interested in uh, just a gay man yelling at cows. That gay man is Max Kremke. He, along with husband Brandon Raisler and Patty Jacobs, own Bastrop Cattle Company. This trio is changing outdated stereotypes of cattle ranchers. Their farmhouse is even pink. I think that rural Texas gets painted with a broad brush, that it's going to be uh, intolerant or, or traditional. I get the sense uh, from a lot of people in certain areas that they don't see that many uh, uh, gay ranchers around. 
And it is, uh, it is really interesting because uh, everybody's been very warm and accepting. There are some decent numbers of women that are going back into farming and ranching. And there's always been kind of a history of women ranching in Texas. Y'all be nice. The ranch has been in the family since 1970, and I grew up here. Patty left the ranch for two decades after college, but then decided to come back home, taking over the family ranch in 2006. Patty and brother Cleve transitioned it to an entirely grass-fed operation. <laughs> The calves are born here, so the majority of the animals have always been here their entire lives. They're really bred to live on this ranch and get the most out of the grass that we have here. As Patty and Cleve were growing their herd, Cleve died of lung cancer in 2013. Patty needed more hands to run the farm. I ran for office and met uh, Max's husband, Brandon. And pretty soon, Brandon was helping me with the business, even though we lost the campaign. And we just kind of grew it from there. And then Max came into it about three years ago. City boy, uh, never ever thought that I would be living out in rural Texas. Hey, Elijah. Hey, big boy. Hey, big boy. I met my husband about 11 years ago, and he was from a small town, and I'm from Austin. We immediately fell in love. We knew that we were the right one for each other. And it was uh, so interesting because he's always been really passionate about cattle ranching. <laughs> Bass Trop's cattle are raised without hormones or antibiotics on chemical-free pastures. The trio selectively breed the animals to thrive in central Texas from enduring drastic weather changes to scavenging for local plants. And we call our cows hustlers. Um, because we expect them to hustle. They eat the grass, but they also eat the oak leaves, they eat uh, cactus. The labor-intensive process yields beef that is well-marbled and tender despite the cow's grass-only diet. For nearly a decade, Bastrop sold most of its premium meat to restaurants, but demand shifted radically during the pandemic. We had to pivot within a two-week period to 100% direct, and then we were backed up six months. We didn't know if we could ship beef. I was delivering all of the beef myself. Now we're in a completely different area. We're boxing it and we're shipping it and we could get it anywhere in Texas in two days. Max's background in film production and marketing helped support their new venture. He built a new website and launched a social campaign targeted at a new demographic. A lot of places that we saw do uh, kind of like what I'd consider to be like man meat. We actually kind of chose to go a different way on ours by being more inclusive in terms of our brand language and how we try to appeal. We try to direct it more towards the woman in the household because they're the ones who are going to be making the decision about what goes in that freezer. Customers really love knowing where their beef comes from and so they keep on coming back and we're happy to have them. But it's not only sales that have grown for Bastrop. Their ranch is famous on TikTok. Max's TikTok account is more than 4 million likes. He's hoping to inspire a new generation of more diverse farmers by sharing his love for agriculture. You my sweet, sweet boy. You let me rub around on your horns. You let me go under the chin. Whenever somebody's like, oh, uh, you really inspire me as a gay man doing this, which I'm not trying to do that. I like, I'm not setting out to be like, I'm an icon and a hero for being a rancher. What I think is really important is just trying to normalize that idea that normalize the fact that it's not just one type of person that's yeah. involved. It's everybody is invited. All of the women, the gays, everybody else getting involved in agriculture is actually providing a lot of new energy and new innovation. Unlike Max, Brandon prefers to stay out of the spotlight and focus on caring for the herd. The trio built a business that feels more like a family. We kind yeah. of take care of each other and believe in the same sort of the same sort of ethics and moral. Patty hopes that Max and Brandon will eventually take over the business as the two share Patty's vision of farming her family's land for years to come. There's something special about this. It's not just that I'm a woman and he's gay. We want something that we can feel comfortable with, that we can steward on through and continue doing it, where it's a, a brand that you've heard about for a really long time and you know that you can depend on it. Our Pride special continues after the break.
Welcome back. From lipstick to eyeshadow, beauty products allow users to feel like better versions of themselves. And now the world of beauty is more expansive with the rise of gender-inclusive beauty brands. Take a look. For years, the beauty industry has marketed products towards an exclusive audience. So how come you're putting lipstick on? The girls always got to look her best. But now, gender-inclusive beauty brands are redefining beauty standards beyond the binary. When we speak about gender inclusivity um, and gender expansive identities, what we really mean by that is that anybody can express any aspect of their self as they'd like regarding gender. Laura Kraber was inspired by her experience as a parent to create We Are Fluid in 2018. I've just been so inspired by the young people who are leading a societal shift and creating a more expansive understanding of gender identity. I just felt like now was the time to create a brand that was welcoming to people of all skin tones, all gender expressions, all gender identities. Laura was on to something. 69% of Gen Z and millennials are looking for more brands that offer gender inclusive products, according to a report from YPulse, a youth marketing research company. Now many are turning frustration into fuel to start their own beauty brands. I was inspired to create Dragon Beauty after being a little frustrated that the beauty industry wasn't reflecting someone like myself as a trans woman in the marketplace. I feel like beauty really needs to match the world. The world is colorful and people come in a, an array of a spectrum and in different sizes, shapes, ethnicities, you name it. Patrick Starr created One Size to encourage kindness and expression. It's important for me to share the voices of the unseen and the unheard in my community because once upon a time, I was one of those customers. I was scared to buy makeup. I felt like I was going to be judged. I felt like no one was going to accept me. The One Size brand mission is to represent everyone through beauty. Makeup is a one size fits all. To keep up with high demand, these brands are shifting their focus to incorporate inclusivity and representation from products to marketing and beyond. We really need to champion those that are unconventional and different. I think we're all tired of seeing the same type of model again and again. I think we're living through a moment where that is really changing. And I think in 10 years, we'll see even more change. For me, it's so important to have trans models, to have models of color, to have a workspace that reflects room that I want to be in. For these founders, personal experience led to products that are changing the world of beauty for the better. I was wanting to look in the mirror and see the woman that I felt inside. These beauty products really helped me find who I was and have always been my protective armor in facing the world. I wasn't born like this, I didn't get to wake up like this, but if I can put on a little bit of sequins and lashes and lipstick, I can really feel confident in being who I really want to be, and that's for everybody too. Through their efforts, gender-inclusive brands are redefining what beauty should be and reminding the world how beauty should make you feel. 
Thank you for joining me this half hour to celebrate Pride is Universal. I'm Joe Fryer. We'll see you next time on Today All Day. Time for a special Make Ahead Monday. If you're firing up the grill today, we have some creative and delicious ways to use all of your leftovers. You see them, you know them, you love them. Here to help us is chef and owner of Pig Beach in Brooklyn, Matt Abdu. Matt, welcome yes, to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. We're let's, super excited today. Let's dig in. All right, we're first starting off with some <laughs> hot dog hash. Yes. We've got all these leftovers. You don't know what to do with them. We're going to do a little fun and unique twist on it all. Take your leftover hot dogs. Okay. We're going to slice them really thin, sear them up. In a pan, we're going to start with some chopped Good. or cut up potatoes. Easy Put them right enough. on in. Yep. This couldn't be easier. Yeah. So potatoes go in the pan, onions, pepper, some garlic, all just goes right on in. Okay. You're going to cover it, cook it for about 10 minutes. Will Al Roker sneak into your house and eat your food while, uh, you, while you cook? Only if you're lucky. Okay. Oh my God, one of the greatest things ever. So you're okay. going to cover this, let yeah. this cook, uh, season with a little bit of salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. Until the potatoes are nice and tender, they're gonna start to take on a little bit of color. Did you just make this up? I've never heard of this. I, you know what? I, it was kind of inspired by that Peruvian dish. It was like hot dogs and French fries, mm. but it was like, what way oh, can you do? Yes. I wanted to do like a breakfast, lunch, dinner kind I of love thing it. with all these leftovers. Love it. So the potatoes are gonna cook with the onions, and you have all these leftover hot dogs sliced about a quarter of an inch thick, okay. browned up like you're doing fried bologna. Okay. Toss all mm. those in with some sliced scallions to sort of finish and garnish. I love and just give it a good old mix. So this is our all-purpose barbecue seasoning. I've made this a few times before for you guys. Okay. It's just a, a great thing to use as a seasoner for the hash or for your ribs or for burgers, chicken, whatever you want to do. What's in it? And we got some cumin, granulated garlic, granulated onion, hatch, chili, salt, pepper, garlic, paprika, and some thyme. Ooh. I need all those on. That is delicious. We do. This is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, Am I allowed to say that? PigBeachNYC.com? And is then we're just going to season it's the top delicious. of it with a little bit of sprinkle of that all-purpose barbecue seasoning. Okay. And breakfast is on the table with some leftover hot dogs. This is an A+. Plus. All, all right. right. Rock and roll. All right. So you got some leftover burgers. Yes, sir. What can we do? All right. We're going to take them. We're going to crumble them all up as you have them seen in this pan here. Mm -hmm. This is roughly about uh, five hamburgers or so. And then we're going to take the peppers, cut off the tops, right. and some onions and some uh, garlic. And you're just going to saute them all until they're nice and soft and translucent. It. You're going to dump that in the bowl. Yeah. Uh, some bulgur wheat. We have bulgur oh. wheat that's mm -hmm. been just soaked, strained. That's going to go in the bowl. So that's kind of your binder? Yeah, this is kind of inspired from a dish I grew up eating called kusa. My father used to make it for me all the time. Yeah, Dad, kusa in a yeah. soft pepper form. Uh, we're going to add some cumin, some za'atar, some salt, some pepper. Mm. Mm. And we have some uh, basil and mint. We're going to mix all that in there. And then for a little, yeah, give it a good old stir, stir for me. And uh, you kind of have a little cheese and ah. stuffed pepper. So we're going to mm -hmm. put some Parmesan in there. Some eggs to work as the binder that's gonna kind of hold it all together when mm -hmm. it cooks. And last but not least, a little bit of Greek yogurt. Oh, so the Greek yogurt's gonna give it a nice creamy flavor profile. Also, mm -hmm. that yogurt goes really well with the meat. Yeah, um, it's not dry. Yeah, it's, well, that's, it's very that's moist. the hope. The cheese, the yogurt, the eggs mm -hmm. makes it all really mm -hmm. nice and moist. We're gonna stuff it in these peppers. Right. We're gonna put a can of fire roasted tomatoes on the bottom of it, oh. which you can get at the grocery try store. They're absolutely mm -hmm. delicious. Cover it with foil, bake for about 45 minutes to an hour until the peppers are tender and the peppers are cooked through. Garnish it with this little uh, mm. tzatziki, sort of New York City white sauce, wow. I call it, okay. recipeontoday.com. Mm. Yum. Check it out. It's absolutely fun, delicious, it's great delicious. way of using up leftover burgers. I've fantastic. never thought of reusing hamburgers Well, most in that people way. don't. And, and, I I and why peppers. would you, right? What a great idea. All right, so moving on, finally, dilly dilly. We got yes. some pasta salad dilly for dilly. you, girl. Uh, I'm excited for this. You growing up some vegetables like me, it's right home for any sort of holiday, you got some leftover grilled mm -hmm. vegetables. There's so many different things you can do with it. What I love during the summertime is making pasta salad. I grew up having this in my fridge mm -hmm. for my mom. Super simple. You have leftover peppers, zucchini, onions, some grilled corn. We're going to take it all and Throw pour this right, right in. into all a pound right. of tricolor uh, pasta or whatever pasta you like. Mm -hmm. We're going to make a really simp simple and easy Italian vinaigrette, some red wine vinegar, some olive oil, some oregano, uh, salt, pepper, chili flake, a little bit of honey. Gives it a little nice You're sweetness. Good with yes. Well, thank you. It means a roll to me. <laughs> that is And job. then we're just going to add in some tomatoes. Some Perfect. feta cheese. Oh. And, I love the feta and, olive oh, combo. Me too, oh, girl. Man. And then these are kalamatas. You can really use black olives or whatever olive you really like. Perfect. And then we're going to dump onto it that Italian seasoning. Oh, Italian man. vinaigrette. Oh. Give it a nice big old stir. The great thing about this is it'll keep in your refrigerator for the full week. I was going to say, how far advance could you, you make? Well, it's better if you make it the night before. That oh way the pasta God. really gets to marinate in that vinaigrette. Nice. 
It's good, oh right? My wow. Simple. This my mom, Ma, love it. We used to grow up eating this. My mom would have a whole Tupperware of this in the fridge in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Every meal oh, wow. she'd pull it out, put it on the table with whatever we were eating in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Take this with you to the out. beach. So Why not? You know, yeah. anywhere. Fresh. Warm or cold. It's fresh. Or, yeah. It's light. It's just such a great, uh, simple, easy thing to do with some leftover veggies. Mm. It is time for a media edition of Make Ahead Monday. Mm. And Jordan Andino, mm. chef and owner of Flip Siggy here in New York, is going to show us how to make a pork adobo. How do you, how do you start? Yeah, you know, so that's why. So I have a glove right here just for in terms of time management. But right here you have actually a pork butt or a pork shoulder. So what, what I like about this is that it's a delicious cut of meat, but it just takes some time to braise. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's not that intimidating. Notice it's really big. All you got to do, it's typically boneless and skinless. Okay. So all you, all you got to do is just pretty much cut it up into maybe one and a half, two-inch cubes. It doesn't need to be pretty. You kind of just... Go at it and just make large cubes so that it just cuts the cooking time down from like three hours to maybe two hours instead. Oh my gosh! So, so super good. simple. Yeah, you know, you just have the you know chunks like this. As you guys can see, it's not you know too crazy. Okay. And then once you, once you break down your big piece, you'll have kind of your nice bowl of like already chopped up meat right there. You guys are enjoying it already. So, so what are you adding? See. What are you adding? Yeah, before, where is all this flavor the coming? The flavor from? is coming like before it starts to braise. Yeah, so, you know, um, all you have to do, it's pretty simple at that point. Once it's cut, um, let's pretend the stove top is right here. We have my pot. All you got to do is add a little bit of oil to, to the base, and this is going to help you saute and caramelize everything and, okay. and garner a lot more flavor from the minced garlic, which I just threw in. And then after that, once the garlic browns, you're going to throw in your pork shoulder that you just cut. So you're just going to put that in and just let that really – kind of brown and just get some and more flavor, so a little bit of caramelization. It's not too hard. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, no, it's it is perfect. So delicious. Yeah, no, no. And it's, it's, it's supposed to be just delicious and easy. After that, the flavor that you guys are getting comes from a couple of things. It's going to be your oyster sauce, okay. which oh. is like, you know, seafood, oyster flavored yeah. sauce, along with a little bit of sriracha, which is kind of your, mm -hmm. you're going to give you your hot and sweetness right there. But really what I want to concentrate on the flavors are these three ingredients right here. You have your swan sea soy, and then your dati puti vinegar, and then your mushroom soy Where sauce. Where do you get those? My grandmother's going to kill me. These are her, the three combination recipe to make the adobo, and the true Filipinos oh, out there will really appreciate these. Oh, secret is out. These. Yeah. <laughs> that Secret's out. Yeah, so all vinegar. you got to do, mm. yeah, basically all you got to do is just put, you know, pour all this in there. It's super simple. You just pour it in. It's about like three quarters cup of the swan soy, three quarters cup of the dark mushroom soy. Mm. Those have a lot of sodium in it. So you don't need to add any salt. That's going to give you that awesome flavor. And then that tanginess that you guys are tasting is from this cane sugar vinegar from the Philippines wow. here. Oh, yeah. Where can you buy that? So, you know, there's a couple of, uh, like, you know, we'll call them Asian marts all around, like Queens, Jersey, and um, in the East Village. Um, you know, it's, and also Chinatown. It's hard to find, but once you do find it, these are ingredients that you always want to keep so stocked good. because it's so delicious. Yeah. And it's a great replacement yeah. for just your regular kind of white what? vinegar. Well, it I'm is gonna, so good. But, you know, Jordan, I'm yeah, enjoying so this over you, rice, but I know you can also, once you're left with all these leftovers, you can turn it into this amazing torta. Yum. Yeah, you're right. You know, so, you know, once it's done, you know, you have your beautiful plate like this, which you guys are having. And then you have your torta. So your torta, which you guys have right there, mm. are, you know, that's how we get to the leftover Mondays because you make a big, big, you know, batch of this mm. two-pound pork. You got to build a sandwich. So I have this, I have mine right here. All you guys got to see right there is you have your, right. you know, your toast and then your meat and it's already made. All you got to do is just start building it. So you have your bottom bun, oh a little bit of mayo, a little bit of hot sauce. But the really, the real concentration here are your pickled onions. So I started mm. with very simple pickled onions. It's just salt, sugar, white vinegar. Boil it, throw in some red onions, and you get that beautiful pink color oh, there. so good. Yeah, do you want to add like a really nice tang? Hey, Go real ahead. quick, real quick, yeah, because pork is so hard to cook for some people. And, and I got to say, I'm, I'm Cuban, so like Filipinos, we eat a lot of pork. This is amazing. How do you know when your pork's done? Okay, that's a great question. So I'm going to show you guys what, what that's supposed to look like. So as you guys can see, you, you know because of how tender everything is. So all you got to do is just cook it, cook it, braise it for pretty much like two hours, and then you're going to get this. And I'll give you a nice little reveal real quick. It should look something like that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So any of you guys can see apart. it. It just really just falls apart. So here's how you know. All you, you know that everything's ready. You just got to take your pork, put it on a plate, and then you're going to see how easy it is. You just take a fork or two and just oh, press it. Wow. There you go. That's why it's so delicious. And you're going to see how quickly it is to pull because that's how you know it's done. Two hours, medium heat, 
And look at that. It just Amazing. comes apart like that. Jordan, you can we are out of time, together. but we, and we have uh, happy plates. We, we, we can't have stop eating. Plate. We've yeah. eaten all of our I've food. I've had sauce all over my face. <laughs>
because ma egg has this magic ability to coat the rice because wow. it's got protein in okay. it. It's got a little natural fat in it. Watch. Look at the bottom of the pan. It doesn't stick. Wow. So it's egg, and once this comes up, okay. I'll season. You stir, and I yeah, season. Okay. That's next Oyster level. sauce. Wow. You Oyster sauce. Yeah. Okay. Soy sauce. I've got Oyster. the meat and the, remember the Korean barbecue short ribs? Mm -hmm. yes. And the vegetables. Once the oh, egg look cooks up, looks what it, look what it becomes. This is amazing. I'll do some this here. This I'll do some here. And you know here. what it is? It's full of flavor and not salt. Like it just it tastes, exactly. you know what I mean? Asian, good Asian foods shouldn't be salt bombs, right? This we should be balancing out vegetables, mm. sweetness, five flavors. Hot, sour, salty, sweet, savory. And hot, sour, That's salty, amazing. sweet, savory, big veggies. That's how mm. you do it. So I love rotisserie chicken. I feel like it's the ultimate shortcut. It's packed with protein. And obviously, you can enjoy it as a standalone with vegetables. But I'm going to show you two ways to sort of take it to the next level. So you would slice the top. You take back the skin and you take those breasts and using your hands, you're just going to shred them so you get lots of small little pieces. Okay. And one rotisserie chicken will yield about three cups of that chicken breast. Mm -hmm. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make, you can see these over here, we're going to make mm, Asian style chicken lettuce wraps. And I'm going to bring you over to my stove and we're going to get cooking. Okay. So Ooh, here yeah, I, I have, camera this is, <laughs> this is um, one onion that was finely diced and then I just sauteed it about five minutes mm -hmm. and the party starts. I add in some hoisin sauce, okay. a little bit of reduced sodium soy sauce. Mm -hmm. This is rice wine vinegar. These are just, you could see these powders, garlic powder and ginger, ginger powder. You can use fresh, but I want to make this super simple Easy. and yes. it comes together lickety split. And you can get this that hoisin is, sauce at Asian markets. I wondered about that. Yes. You eat with pho all you the can, time. You can, you can get it at any grocery store. Is it common day. now? Okay. Hoisin yeah. sauce is everywhere. Yes. Okay. I didn't know. Everywhere. Really it's everywhere. And what I just added, you see, this is chopped water chestnuts. Ah. It's part of the tuber vegetable family and mm -hmm. it adds like that crisp crunch. crunch. Right. It's mm. so delicious and it's very, very light. Okay. Scallions, if you like me and you absolutely love onion and a little cashews or peanuts yeah. right. so and you're you can gonna leave those out if you're allergic yeah. right absolutely and you mix this up and now mm. we're ready for our chicken so this is how much chicken i got oh. wow from that rotisserie three cups and you just mix this whole thing together and you let it simmer for about 10 15 minutes until mm. everything's hot and i'm going to bring you back over to the island. Okay. Come on over here. here. It's for so dinner. easy. I like how yeah. it's always in one skillet. That makes it so much easier. Yeah. Yes. And and mm. they're low carb. They're packed with protein. Mm. And guys, right. you could gobble down so many of these. And you'll feel yes. like you're in your favorite Asian restaurant. And you got barbecue yeah. sliders. Ooh, sliders. Okay. Are these are saucy and scrumptious. I'm bringing <laughs> you back over to my stove now. Okay. This is so funny. Let me clear this. Okay. Okay. Don't judge me on my messiness. Are you no, kidding me? That's like an <laughs> always ready <laughs> set that you, you live in. You don't have our <laughs> food prep stuff. Like Katie Stuhl oh doing stuff. You're so right. So over here, so what I'm doing is, this is going to be um, red wine vinegar. We're mm -hmm. going in a totally different flavor direction. Mm -hmm. Now we have soy sauce. Right. This is a can of no salt added tomato sauce. Um, this mm -hmm. is the spirit of sloppy joes. I guess we could call yeah. these sloppy joys. Ah, and this is joys. a little, <laughs> like a little bit of uh, that was tomato paste to really bolden up the flavor. Mm -hmm. Salt and pepper. And guys. As the signature Sloppy Joe would have it, mm. I'm adding a little bit of yellow mustard. Oh, okay. That's unexpected. Yeah. Mix it up, mm -hmm. and now we have our chicken again. Here we go. Boom. Chicken goes in, and you mix this up. I'm going to bring you back over to my island. Come okay. on, guys. I love this. I feel we're like back. we're in her house with her. I know. <laughs> and there you have it. Yum. How Joy, much do I want to feed you right now? I wish I, I wish I could wish give you, you a bite. That's, oh. a great, that's a great lunch for anybody. Yeah. Joy Bauer. Yum. Bauer, thanks so much. Always Thank good you, to Joy. see you. And for these... Yeah, I love that. For these... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that looks good. For these that's recipes yummy. and more, head to today.com slash food. <laughs>
Our she next was guest. Trying to make it look like she wasn't chewing. She's talking with her mouth full. Uh, our next guest putting a Texas twist on dinner this week. Here to cook up some delicious pork. Chef, owner of Jamali in Fort Worth, Tim Long. You've, so you've been to the show like two dozen times, so you're an old pro at this. But this new restaurant named after your twin daughters. That's right, Jamali. It's my new Italian place that just opened in Fort Worth. All right. Well, Having we... a lot of fun. So make ahead Monday, and it is Monday, <laughs> so we'll make ahead some stuff. <laughs> That's so deep. You know, I mean, this no, is really, what are we this is really genuinely deep stuff. <laughs> so uh, this is a, actually a dish that my wife likes to cook all the time. Oh, so it's pork nice. shoulder that we have in here, bone and pork shoulder. Okay. Uh, make a nice spice rub, rub it really well. This is my pork rub that I I sell, but you can just find a good barbecue rub. What's in your oh, wow. what's in rub? It's guajillo chilies, fresh rosemary, thyme, salt, wow. pepper, cumin. It's really delicious. Okay. And then we add some poblano chilies that are just raw. Okay. Right. Same with the onion, chopped white onion. Then we're adding a can of chipotle chilies because we like to have it hot and spicy. We do like it hot and spicy. And then a little bit of water. We cover it. It takes six hours. And that's it. You that's can it. Walk away. And so then when it's ready, it comes out like this. I've also made some potatoes that we boil. Then we smash them and then grill them on a plancha. Really? Really quickly, simple, what really do you call, delicious. What do you call them, those potatoes? Plancha potatoes. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's move you. Don't come here now. What are we doing? So the next right. dish that we're going to make. <laughs> and you said you got she the leftover pork. She already said you got the leftover pork. Can I tell you something? Tell me something. Dylan, tell him what you just said in my ear. This is the best thing I've ever had. <laughs> this, this quesadilla is unbelievable. This should be on that show, the best thing I ever ate. So let's okay. explain what you're doing. So let's do it. So here we got a saute pan. I've got some... Uh, Bell peppers, we're gonna add in here like this. Tastes fresh. Some chopped onions, yeah. Really See, good. you know, vegetables are like people, right? They come in different sizes, they come in different flavors, they come in different personalities. And you wanna make sure that when you saute the vegetables, that uh -huh. you give it time to develop. Meaning, we don't want them to be raw, but we, want to, we don't wanna cook them all the way, because we want the crunch of the vegetables. That's why, left. is that why it tastes so fresh? That's right. So then oh, we so take a tortilla, it. Okay. that's spread some goat cheese on here like this. Goat cheese, that's And now you're gonna take the beans and spread well, it on this side. Eating goat cheese. And then you puree the beans? <laughs> puree the beans, spread on this side. I've this never, side. I, I'm a horrible. I know, it's, it's hard to develop 50-50, but it's like. <laughs> puree with goat cheese, then we that's put, why it's so good. We put the mixture on like this, okay? And then we're gonna fold it in half. Look guys. After. You Did I do too cheese. many beans? No, you can actually you can make have these. I know, that's what I'm saying. It's Hold life it changing. Half. Oh, you're right about that. And press it down. Right. Now, and then just swap take it on the there. brush and oh, brush it with a little bit of yeah. canola oil. Like so. Now you can do this outside, okay? Okay. If you're at the house, you can do it on the grill. Now put it okay, right on the grill. I feel like I did that perfectly. You obviously did it well, perfectly. Well, you put the right on the side, so, yeah. So you put it. I'm gonna, you know, it's going to look great. Don't worry about me. You just do you. That's the most cooking you've <laughs> done in two years. That's the, best, that's the most cooking I've ever seen her do on this show, by the yeah. way. Now let me go back <laughs> to chewing. Yes. Chanel back to eating. eats really well. Tony, it finishes, yeah. and you want to put a little bit of the creamy jalapeno sauce. Oh, like, it's actually, all the jalapeno blade. Okay, we only have a minute left, but we've got ramen noodles to make now. Okay, ramen noodles. So here, same pork, right? Yep. We whip this egg, we okay. add a little salt and pepper because we're gonna we're gonna dice this egg up later. So we okay. add it in here. Let the egg cook all the way through. So we're gonna roll that around. Okay. A little oil. Don't there. worry about it, it'll just keep cooking. Okay. Then we take the pork shoulder mm -hmm. and we drop it in this dressing like this. This What's has in that? green onions, garlic, a little bit of soy sauce, and we mm. let it sit for five minutes. Perfect. Then we take ramen noodles, the cheap ramen noodles that you buy at the store, right? Nice. Cook them. Don't worry about the seasoning. Take the noodles, put them here like this okay. after they're cool. We got some beef sprouts. We got some sake. Mm -hmm. We got some rice wine vinegar. Mm. We got some nori. Wow, right here. all those Asian And then you take flavors. your egg and you, oh, you slice it up after it's cooked. Okay. And it gets like this. You top that on top. And then you take your pork that's been sitting in the juice. Mm. You mix it up. Okay. You act like a great oh, American hero. Good. And, and then it you totally eat it. Changes How the is flavor it? of everything. This is delicious. It's nice. So three Thank different ways. Make Thank it you so Monday. much for these recipes and more. Log on Show to today.com slash so good. Yeah.
weather's warming up, the last thing you want to do is to spend hours inside cooking. That's no fun. Katie Lee Beagle, co-host of Food Networks. The Kitchen has a simple sheet pan recipe that got more than a million what? views when she first posted yes. it. Is this a viral recipe? Wow. I mean, people love salmon, it turns out, True. and they love sheet pan recipes. All you have to do, chop up some broccoli and some sweet potatoes. You want your sweet potatoes to be in cubes, and your broccoli can be, you know, a little bit on the medium side, sure. because you want everything to cook at the same time oh. on the sheet pan. Okay. Uh. So instead of buying fillets of salmon, we're gonna just do one big piece. And do you so ask that them at the, the supermarket to de-skin it? For this recipe, I do. Most of the time, I cook salmon with, with the, the skin, skin on. on. But for this one, because you'll see we're going to add a sauce to it, I like it skinless. Okay. So I'm going to add a little bit of oil to our Super veg. Simple. Yeah, and some salt and pepper. Salt and and all I pepper. did was yep. and pepper that salmon up for me. Ooh, fun. So that's all we're doing to it. And then we're going to make our sauce because this is a honey mustard. Ooh. I did I didn't even tell you all what we were making. Honey, <laughs> honey mustard, oh, salmon, yum. with sweet potatoes and broccoli. So I've got equal parts of honey, and I like to use a, a like coarse a mustard. Poupon? Yes, nice, yes. <laughs> Very oh, good. Sense. Speaking yeah. of the Paris test, right? You're getting yeah, ready totally. for your travels. Exactly. <laughs> and then mix it together. This goes right on top of the salmon. I mean, so simple. And some of it's going to run off, and that's okay, because we're going to mix that with our veggies. So Willie, take those veggies mm -hmm. and okay. scatter them scatter. all around. Can I touch them with the yeah. Okay, protocol nowadays. So you washed your hands. Yeah. yeah. I washed earlier. All right, so that's going to go into the oven. Oh, and I put parchment paper on because that makes our cleanup a lot easier. That's Remove. smart. Oh, that's yes. Very smart. Yes, yeah. then you're barely, you won't have to use Scrape any elbow cream. Yeah. yeah. All right, so put that in the oven, 425 degrees. It comes out like this. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's very easy. We love it. How, Irish how, how long salmon for 425? Too. About 25, 30 minutes. Now, if you want to do this in fillets, cook your broccoli and sweet potatoes for about 10, 15 minutes first, then add your salmon fillets and cook it the rest of the way. Okay. Because it'll be a different cook time. All right, so you want to have some leftovers for lunch of yes, that we salmon. Do. We're going to make a little salmon salad here with a lemon caper vinaigrette. Uh, I love caper so me much. Too, yes, me so too. we've got our Here's lemon. Let's put a little zest in mm. there and some capers and Dijon mustard. Yeah. Mm. Salt and pepper it up. Sure. Little splash of white wine vinegar here. Wow. Whisk it, whisk it, whisk it. And then we're going to come down here to our salad. How beautiful. I've just got bib lettuce. I've got thinly sliced celery in here. I've always got celery in my fridge. Some cucumbers go in. Good cutting, Jen. You know, you can kind of just use what you have. No, that's good. You said that. No, it's real and, good. Uh, <laughs> okay. Jenna, you said you don't cook much. You're doing a great no, job. Was, well, I, I assemble. Cucumbers. Assemble. And I okay. chop. Mm -hmm. All right. We got chives. By the way, does parsley. your daughter eat cucumbers? Not really. Okay. No, I she can't will. get a vegetable she in She will. Occasionally sweet potatoes, occasionally avocado. Okay. All right, so we're going to add our salmon in here. You just flake it up after it comes out. And you can also use canned salmon for this if you didn't make the recipe. You okay. know, canned salmon's a great thing to have around. If you want to add these veggies to it, you can. If not, have it right on its own. Looks Add beautiful. Add the dressing too. Wow. to it. I've got some down here for you guys. Yeah, we're coming to oh, taste. Thank you very much. Come taste. Did you get one though? Have That's a bite. This is yours? mine. Oh, she has the bowl. Like, right out of the bowl. I like large portions of salad. <laughs> I call it my trough salad. I just, you just eat straight out get of in it. There, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to The Boost. So over the next half hour, we hope to boost your day. We're going to leave you feeling a little inspired by these hopeful stories in the field of medicine. First up, a twin brother dedicating his life to finding a cure after his own brother became paralyzed. Kate Snow shares how together they're working to change the world. Growing up in New York City, identical twins Jason and David Carmel were close, and by high school, a bit competitive. We were both wrestlers, <laughs> so when that started, there may have been a skirmish or two <laughs> on, the, on the rug of the bedroom. After college, Jason headed to medical school at Columbia. David was about to start an MBA at Stanford, but first a trip to Mexico. I did a shallow dive, and there was a sandbar, so I hit the top of my head and broke my neck. Uh, luckily, I had a couple of friends there. They were able to drag me out of the water, but I was instantly paralyzed and couldn't move anything or feel anything from my chest down. Immediately? Immediately. 
his twin Jason got the news. I would say that moment of receiving the call was one moment, and then just going and seeing him. It's still tough. So seeing him in the ICU, you know, you see all the tubes and, the, and everything else. It was, a, it was a hard moment. David spent months in rehabilitation, learning to live in a new body, as he puts it, learning to navigate life in a wheelchair, returning to Stanford for that MBA, and changing the future for his twin. How much did his accident maybe inspire you to go into what you're in now? Uh, I mean, it's the reason. That, it, that I'm in it. Jason decided to specialize in neurology and neuroscience, specifically nerve regeneration and ways to help people with spinal cord injuries recover function. What could be more touching than your identical twin brother going into an area of research that is because he wanted to help? David focused on bringing new therapeutics to patients and last fall joined the foundation for the National Institutes of Health, connecting top scientists with influential leaders in the private sector. It's been great to have this double-sided coin where I'm the rabble rouser and the money guy and he's the scientist and physician. Here is the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And now, Jason is working on a project that could one day help his own brother, studying new ways to pair brain and spinal cord stimulation using electrodes. We're trying to get brain and spinal cord to partner to produce movement. It's early, but he hopes the research could one day help people regain movement in their arms and hands. There's often some spared connections, and so our goal is to take those spared connections and make them functional. What if this helped your brother one day? I would be thrilled. Both men have families, and they get together all the time. Their relationship, stronger than ever. It became much more collaborative and competitive. Yeah. You become a team. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're running the same race, but we're both going to lean hard at the tape, so. <laughs> They have literally raced together, Jason carrying David on his back after the swim portion of a triathlon. Together, they've lobbied for funding of spinal cord injury research in New York State. Honestly, it's a blessing that we are approaching this problem together, as two brothers in particular. It feels great waking up every day knowing that even if we're not in the same physical location, we're, we're all pulling in the same direction. My word, what a dynamic duo. Coming up next, a girl facing her own health struggles who still found time to create a glam camp that's spreading joy to children. Jenna Bush Hager has her story. She just had this twinkle in her eye and she attracted young kids and kids her age and her teachers and adults just loved her, especially for her positivity and, and her resilience for sure. It was her resilience that always inspired me. Penny Durkee was born with a genetic condition called neurofibromatosis, but I can assure you that was the least interesting thing about her. Penny was an artist, and in fact, we're surrounded by some of her art right now. She was a dancer. Genesis. She always looked out for my girls. Loved she was a mentor to a lot of kids and a great friend. Nobody knew that she had had 15 surgeries. From the very first moment she was diagnosed, we had a choice and we chose joy and positivity and that she was going to lead the most beautiful life. And so we didn't let it define her because that's not who she was. At age 16, Penny's beautiful life was cut too short. When she did leave us, we looked at each other and we said, we are gonna celebrate her life and no one's gonna wear black to this service. Because honestly, Penny's girlfriends and all of her friends, they've never lost anyone. So how do you teach a 16 year old to understand what loss looks like? It was the first funeral my girls went to. You taught them that there's a different way to grieve. Mm -hmm. The grieving doesn't just look like one thing. No. It can look like colorful dresses and, and singing and beautiful. TikTok dancing. Yeah. <laughs> we were so moved by this outpouring of love from uh, the, our community and, and people far and wide that Kate and I sort of looked at each other and said, we, 
need to do something. Neurofibromatosis causes tumors to grow on nerve pathways in the body. It is one of the most common genetic disorders in the United States, yet it's underfunded. And that's what Penny's flight hopes to change. Penny always loved butterflies. The butterfly represents an inextinguishable soul, always drawn to the light. Mm -hmm. And we just felt that was Penny, and it continues to be. And this idea of spreading wings and spreading positivity, and that the smallest act, like a flap of a butterfly's wing, can cause a revolution. There's so much work to do. Yeah. Yeah. And there's work at the top of the chain studying, you know, why these mutations happen. There's also work, you know, to help um, people live a better life. Penny's Flight is a young foundation, but a mighty one. Their mission is a cure. And in just five months, they've raised more than $1.5 million. We don't have to sit in the darkness. No. We don't have to be alone. We can come together and spread her wings. As they work to raise awareness, they're also bringing hope to other members of the community. Hi, how are you? Families oh, so like good. the Perfettis, whose daughter Julia suffers from the same condition. For Chad and Kate, this is probably like what it's all about. <laughs> it is. While you're living your best life, we're trying to do this to help you and help so many other kids never go through what you've been through and what Penny went through again. And hearing Kate say there will be a cure, yeah, that probably makes you feel pretty good. The fundraising and having that support team gives NF Heroes hope for a better future. It really does make a difference in all our lives. Penny was robbed of her tomorrows, but perhaps her greatest legacy will be giving other children more. And in the words of Penny herself. Affirmations for tomorrow. I choose to live my best life. I'm fearless and confident. Today is filled with possibility and love. I'm my best self today. I am love. We're just getting started here on The Boost. Stay with us. Our next story spotlights the first all-female team to perform a heart transplant. Here's NBC's Kaylee Hartung. In the operating room, it's one of the most drastic surgeries anyone can undergo or perform. A heart transplant is usually a last resort for a patient with a damaged or failing heart. More than 2,000 of these surgeries are done every year here in the U.S. But last December, at the University of California San Francisco Medical Center, marked an apparent first, as an all-women team performed a heart transplant. Every day, you're just waking up to do your job to save lives. And when history gets made in the process, we like to take a <laughs> selfie and commemorate <laughs> This photo captures the moments after they completed the five-hour procedure. The OR, occupied solely by women, including the patient. Cardiothoracic surgeon Amy Fiedler led the five-hour surgery. I hope that the younger generation 
sees it and says, this is something that I can do too. Surgery fellow Laura Scrimger and anesthesiologist Charlene Blake were part of the eight woman team. It wasn't until Dr. Fiedler said at the end of the case, we are all women. <laughs> We, we are, look at that. When you all look at this photo, yes. what do you see? I think what's cool about the picture is that despite everyone wearing masks, you can see that we're all smiling. The groundbreaking surgery defies a long-standing reality in the male-dominated field of cardiology. Despite outnumbering men in American medical schools, women made up just 6% of practicing adult cardiac surgeons in 2019. How often? Are you the only woman in the room or one of just a few? When I was in training, every time I was the only woman outside of the nursing staff, usually. Many, many people tell you not to do it. Even people that love the career, they're like, if you can do anything else, do it. Because this is going to take <laughs> everything in your life to do. Do you think there are any challenges unique to women when it comes to cardiac surgery? Oh, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about this job without speaking about the impact on your personal life, family planning. You're a mother. I am. I have two beautiful children. So like finding time to pump, that was a challenge, you know, when I had came back from maternity leave for my daughter. Now these three doctors are trailblazing yeah. lifesavers, and their patient is healthy and doing well post-surgery. I think what's so amazing is that she also recognizes the impact of the moment. She gave me this huge hug, and she like would not let me go. And I said, I'm so proud of you. And she said to me, she's like, no, I'm so proud of you. Keep doing what you're doing. That's nice. <laughs> I know we're all familiar with, you know, Rosie the Riveter, right? Have you all seen Susie the surgeon? Oh. That's great. I haven't seen that. What emotions does it evoke for you? Pride, strength. Anyone that puts in the time can do this job, and I think it's really amazing. So I hope things like that encourage more women to do it, for sure. What advice would you give to other women who are interested in this field in particular? If this is what you love, go after yeah. it. Yeah, it's hard. You can do hard things. So do it. Do what you love. Next up, the incredible story of a college athlete and his exceptional comeback from heart failure with a new heart and a new sense of purpose on and off the field. Harry Smith has that inspiring story. Take a look. Number 44, Ryan Scoble, is a long pole for the Mercyhurst Lakers. For him, the drills, the repetition is pure pleasure. Let's practice. It's good, it's good. We're uh, honing in on the basics right now, pounding the fundamentals, but it's good. Good, no, remarkable. Because a couple of seasons ago, Scoble, rising the roster at this D2 powerhouse, found himself short of breath, exhausted, thought he had the flu. I was struggling in warm-ups. Um, I got in late in the third quarter, and I was struggling to, to make plays and even really stand up. We're going to start with Laker head coach Chris Ryan. And he came up and he said, Coach, I just can't, I, like, I can't catch my breath. And we, we got him over to the trainer, and then all of a sudden, like, everything started happening. Turns out Scoble's heart was in big trouble. Dilated cardiomyopathy. His heart was failing. I was kind of upset because at this time, I'm, I'm at the peak of my college life. I mean, I'm 21, I'm in the middle of a lacrosse season, and, and now I'm being told I have heart failure. And, and told he wouldn't survive without a new heart a transplant, so off to the Cleveland Clinic. It was everything I thought it was, you know, I, I felt like I was picked up by the, the SEAL Team 6 of nurses, you know, I was... <laughs> While Ryan waited for a new heart, his dad, Steve, was recovering from his own transplant, the same disease, it's congenital. It's been a weird kind of way to bond with my dad, uh, kind of... <laughs> Uh, compared to you how we used to bond, but... You don't uh, recommend it to other... No, I, I don't recommend bonding through, you know, your dad with, with two transplants. Ryan got the new heart, but he was a shell of his former self. I remember we were stepping on the scale once, and she was like, uh, 142. And I was like, jeez. Oh, He'd lost 60 pounds, and at one point, he even flatlined for 11 seconds. He said to himself, you're at ground zero right now. There's only room for improvement. There's only place to step up from here. His goal, play lacrosse again. He contacted his doctors. They look at me and they're like, dude, you, you died here like four months ago, and now you want to go back to a full contact sport? 
Scoble is that guy you don't count out. Come back, he did. It was a great day when he came walking back into the office, but I didn't, I didn't let him know that. I, you know, it was business as usual. I remember like running out there and be like, oh wow, like, you know, I can hit somebody. I remember the first time making that contact and it was just like, wow, you know, and it was. Did you ask your heart, how you doing? Yeah, I was, I was checking in on him and he was doing fine. As if on script, Scoble, the defenseman, scored a goal this season, his first ever in college. Coach Ryan says Native Americans view lacrosse as a gift. But they'll tell you that it was given to us by the creator to help solve problems and it was medicine. The game and the heart of a young man Ryan Scoble does not know beat strong in him. He's thankful for both. You know, due to his donation and his selflessness, I'm, I'm able to continue to live my life. I'm able to graduate from college and, and to move into my, my young adult life, something I, I thought at one point was over. And, and his generous donation is what, you know, wakes me up every day. We've got more inspiring health stories for you coming up right after the break. back on the boost with a med student helping and inspiring his community by bringing health care to the unlikeliest of places. NBC's Steve Patterson has that story. It's two o'clock on Friday and St. Julian's Barbershop in Compton, California is open for business. You can get a buzz. Hey man, I look like Tracy McGrady again. A shape up and even a checkup. Your heart rate went a little faster. Healthcare at the barbershop is all part of a program called Trust Research Access and Prevention, or TRAP Medicine. We're gonna get you vaccinated. The program began with Charles Drew and UCLA medical student Jamil Lacey. He had a big idea and an even bigger goal to make a difference and help save lives. Barbershops really can be leveraged to address some of the disparities that we see in our communities. He began TRAP six years ago, building a network of five barbershops across South Los Angeles that offer free health services. How does TRAP partner with barbershops to provide you know, safe space for people to get health care? So we train barbers. We also bring services into the shop. We do HIV testing. We have conversations around mental health. We also have the capacity to be able to link people to resources in the communities. For Lacey, the issue is deeply personal. I used to be one of those people who had you know, health insurance and hadn't seen a primary care physician because I was afraid of what I would be told. Oftentimes what we hear in the barbershop is like people are just fearful of what they might find out. Jamil is not alone. 
A recent Harris poll funded by Johnson & Johnson showed that nearly half of adults in urban areas delayed health care in the last year. And while the leading barrier was COVID-19, 20% of black adults said they tried to receive care but were unable to. 21% said they didn't have adequate transportation to get to appointments, others noting they were too nervous or didn't even know where to start when it came to finding a provider. To help address those problems, Jamil took inspiration from his own childhood barber who offered health education alongside his haircuts. What is it about barbers, you think, that makes people feel so comfortable? Well, your barber's like your cousin, right? So if you trust somebody with your hairline, you can tell them a little bit about what might be going on in your life, you know what I'm saying? And barbers like Steve Ellis in South LA see the impact too. Many customers come in for a haircut and leave with medical care and advice. You've got 10 people here who get tested, then they go back and tell 10. It just spreads. It just spreads. So we're confident. Here we are. They see is counting on accessibility. I joined him to see how the program works firsthand. Any and everybody can just do this. Anybody. It's just like a regular checkup you'd receive at a doctor's office, including blood pressure checks, glucose and cholesterol level screenings. I was even offered take-home COVID-19 tests. Then there's the main draw. Patients who participate in the medical screening get a free haircut. Why do you think people feel more comfortable in a barber shop than they would in a hospital or a clinic? It's just a comfort zone for us, like the man cave, you know? <laughs> Lacey estimates TRAP has helped serve over 10,000 people at barbershops and pop-up medical tents across Los Angeles. He hopes to graduate by 2025 and take his program nationwide, ultimately pursuing a career in community psychiatry to keep helping people everywhere. The vision for healthcare is that it should be accessible to everybody whenever they need it. That is where we should be headed. And I think the only way to do that is through organizing and by showing people that it can be done. Good. Next up, meet the two women helping to make therapy and treatment for eating disorders more accessible for families everywhere. Chanel Jones sits down with them. You can't build a life worth living if you're not living life. Christina Safran was diagnosed with anorexia when she was just 10 years old. I you know, was fortunate to find you know, four different professionals in my community worked with them over the course of that year. It was such a struggle in my family. And then unfortunately, when I began to enter puberty around 13, I relapsed and I spent essentially my entire freshman year in and out of hospitals, not in high school. It's almost as if, if you don't know anyone with an eating disorder, you don't realize there's a whole world out there of, of, of people who are dealing with this day in and day out. While in recovery at age 15, Christina started a nonprofit, Project Heal, to raise money for those who couldn't afford treatment. Across the country, Dr. Aaron Parks, a clinical psychologist and researcher who had also experienced an eating disorder as a preteen, noticed other barriers to getting help. Months long wait lists to see a doctor, cash only payment centers and more. Oftentimes a mom and a child would come for treatment and they'd leave their other siblings and other parents at home. And it was hard on the entire family. So it made me think, why do people have to travel in order to get treatment? Christina and Aaron found each other and joined forces with one goal in mind. And in 2019, they launched Equip. Equip is a fully virtual treatment program that gives families a five person treatment team, a psychiatrist, a therapist, a dietitian, mentorship, and a physician to help them fully recover from an eating disorder. And they're doing it virtually? 100% virtually. When your child is struggling with an eating disorder, you need to bring your whole village. So using virtual treatments, you can have a family session and have your babysitter call in and your neighbor and your ex-husband and, and the stepfather. Equip is considered in-network with major health insurance plans like Aetna, Cigna, and United Healthcare, as well as Medicaid. The platform is working with almost 1,000 families and treating kids as young as six. Look, no family's perfect, we all have our challenges, but this is something that we're not quite familiar with, but we certainly want to be aware of. Are your kids' eating habits changing? Don't be afraid to ask your child, what's going on with food? Are they secretly exercising in their room? Are they vomiting? Are they struggling? Are you seeing that? Is that happening? Yes, vomiting after meals, uh, secretively exercising in the shower, in their bedroom, in the middle of the night, excessively drinking water, and then 
skipping meals, skipping snacks, and narrowing the range of foods that they eat. What do you do about social media? Not that it's the big bad wolf by any means, but listen, I sit behind my kids and I watch what they watch. Even as an adult, for me, it can, you start to compare yourself. Make sure to really diversify your feed. There are influencers in a variety of different body shapes and sizes who are in a strong and active recovery and can be really healthy role models. Over the last three years, not only have Christina and Aaron shed a light on the challenges of treatment and the network of support that's needed, but 71% of equipped patients report a reduction in eating disorder symptoms and two thirds feel improvements in their mood. While we believe that full recovery is absolutely possible, it is a long journey. It has been really the, the privilege of our lifetimes to start equipped and watch people get better. The lights are coming back on. Uh, kids are remembering who they are outside their eating disorder. They're rejoining their siblings and their friends and their activities. And as a parent, it's been wonderful watching the parents exhale and get to worry a little less about their children. Coming up, the latest viral video to boost your day. Boost, we have one more video that will leave you with a smile. Check it out. <laughs> An exchange student from France studying in Arizona got the surprise of her life when her mom hopped on a plane. She showed up unannounced after not seeing each other for eight months. They're very close. Take a look. <laughs> You want to know what love looks like? Wow. That's that. She was overcome with emotion. That's She's beautiful. Missed her. They've been so far away. And that was exactly what she needed at that moment. Well, that's all the time we have, guys. But we will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on Today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's Today. Like I won the no. lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The mirror's on. The mirror. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on Today. Hello and welcome to our Today All Day Pride special, Pride is Universal, Better Together. I'm Joe Fryer. In the next half hour, we're going to highlight stories affecting the LGBTQ community, stories of hope, healing, and inspiring individuals making this world a more inclusive place. We begin in Memphis with the story of Kayla Gore. While homelessness is a national issue, finding safe shelter can be difficult, especially for transgender individuals. Kayla's organization is hoping to change that by building houses and putting more than a roof over the heads of those in need. Take a look. 
It's a city known for its barbecue and blues, but just minutes from the hustle and bustle of Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee is also home to a vibrant yet vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. We're in the Bible Belt of the South, and it's a, it's a red state in terms of housing access and discrimination, employment access and discrimination. There's no real legal protections for trans people. Nationally, one in five trans individuals is said to have experienced homelessness at some point in their life, and nearly a third live in poverty. Those figures are even higher when you account for race. I was born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. When Kayla Gore was just 23 and newly transitioning, she experienced homelessness while living 1,500 miles from the city where she grew up. It was very, very scary. After returning to Memphis, she entered a transitional housing program and began working without Memphis, the local LGBTQ community center. During that time, Kayla says she started to see a lot of trans and queer people kicked out of their homes at the age of 18, some rejected by their families. While there are services for individuals experiencing home insecurity in Memphis, many are faith-based. There's lots of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, and more importantly, a lot of those shelters are separated by sex assigned at birth. You're forced into a situation of either outing yourself or staying closeted in an environment where you could be incredibly unsafe. There's also a lot of trans folks of color here, so then you also kind of double down with racism. They have a lot stacked up against them. The pandemic exacerbated that. A survey by the Trevor Project found last year more than 80% of trans and non-binary youth said COVID-19 led to a more stressful living situation. Hoping to change that, Kayla, who'd been able to purchase her own home, which she shared with others who found themselves experiencing homelessness, founded My Sister's House. We wanted to provide like a space where people can thrive and they can actually start to grow um, and heal the trauma that they had you know, experienced in their youth. Originally a word of mouth program, my sister's house aimed to provide emergency services and shelter to trans and queer people of color. It's for us by us, like it's trans people at the helm of it and it's from a perspective of someone who's been there. I was homeless as a youth, so I, I remember what it was like being vulnerable. As my sister's house evolved, so did their mission. Now the group is aiming to build 20 homes for trans women in Memphis. It's safe to say that I did not come from a background of building houses or working with plumbing and electrical, uh, but it is safe to say that I came from a family that had really love and compassion for the community that they live in. Originally planning to build tiny homes, they're now renovating existing homes because of the rising costs of everything, including lumber. Using a lottery of individuals they've previously helped, recipients get more than a shelter, they actually own the house. It's a different feeling when you um, have your own place. Jeanette Adams moved into her home just a few months ago. It's a tiny house, but it, you know, it's big to me. Jeanette had been living with her mom and has a supportive family, but being able to live on her own has boosted her confidence. I felt free. A lot of people, especially trans women, we don't get a chance to own anything. Kayla says that's exactly what she's hoping to provide those selected to receive a house. Trans people are boxed out of economics in so many different ways that we have to build our own economics. This is how people built generational wealth 100 years ago where their families had small homes. So it's nothing new that we're doing. It's just that we're doing a unique thing for a community that really deserves it. Just a couple miles from Jeanette's home, crews are replacing the electrical system at another property. This will be our fifth house that will be occupied. Modie James will soon call this two bedroom home her own sanctuary. I'm ecstatic about it because it would be mine. If my, it would be my home, not my house. Modie says she does not feel safe in her current living arrangements. I've been trying to get a home on my own. They take you to the ringer and they expensive. I see nothing and I live nothing but poverty. I'm trying to overcome it. LGBTQ advocates in Memphis say my sister's house is giving people more than a place to live. It also created visibility and hope and inspiration for the trans community and for trans people of color here in the South that just wasn't there before. If I had the opportunity to receive the resources that we provide today, I couldn't imagine what my life would be like. Kayla hopes to expand and replicate what my sister's house has done in other cities. She also hopes the program has something of an expiration date. I would want the legacy of my sister's house to be that we came, we conquered, and we disappeared because we no longer were needed.
My Sister's House operates mostly through donations and grants. A GoFundMe for the group has generated more than $300,000. Kayla says they have a goal to build and renovate 20 homes by the end of next year. Coming up, Craig chats with the sole openly gay professional baseball player in the league. Plus, this cattle ranch has become a social media sensation for its grass-fed beef and the queer farmers behind the brand. Stay with us. Baseball, America's favorite pastime. We might sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, but it's a profession that only has one out player, Brian Ruby. Craig recently caught up with Brian to hear about his experiences as a gay professional baseball player and how his dad's support has made all the difference. Take a look. Meet Brian Ruby, the only openly gay professional baseball player in the United States. Brian first came out publicly last season while playing independent baseball for the Salem Kaiser Volcanoes in Oregon. I decided that I'd come out to my teammates last season by lacing up with rainbow shoelaces during Pride Month. I considered it more like inviting in than coming out. Yep, this is who I am. You threw me one curveball. Brian's dad, John, whose last name the family would like to keep private, was Brian's high school baseball coach, and as to be expected, has always been his son's biggest fan. When did you know that Brian was going to be a baseball player? Something clicked around six or seven, and he got passionate about baseball, and we were always on the baseball field. John had some success of his own on the diamond, playing Division I ball as a pitcher at the University of Pennsylvania and then overseas in Australia. That experience led him to have some initial fears about his son's baseball career when Brian shared his plans to go public about his sexuality. In your heart of hearts, did you think it would change his opportunities? I was worried about how he would be perceived in that world. There were a million things running through my mind but what I wanted him to know in that moment was, I'm good, and you're good. And he wasn't just good, he was great. After tying up his rainbow laces and coming out to his teammates in the public overall, Brian's batting average skyrocketed a full 90 points. So what was it like last season? Well, I don't know if I'm gonna get applauded when I run onto the field or if, I'm gonna be in the batter's box and get hit by a 93 mile an hour fastball in the head. The real thing that happened was I got a hit, you know, my first at bat and got on base and the pitcher tipped his cap and I just gave him a little tip back and that peer to peer on field recognition was by far the most meaningful thing in the game of baseball. And Brian's not only talking openly about his own story, he's also co-founder of Proud to Be in Baseball, an organization that supports and advocates for ballplayers of all ages who are looking for gay mentors in the sport. 
Brian's work with Proud to be in Baseball has taken him around the country to attend Pride events at a number of MLB ballparks. In September of 2021, he was invited to sing the national anthem at Dodger Stadium. Oh, say can you see? In addition to being a, a, quite, the, quite the baseball player, you're a, you're a budding country music star. I always loved country music and uh, I've been writing songs. I always have my guitar on the road during baseball, playing on the team bus. I mean, which do you enjoy more, baseball or, or country music? <laughs> I gotta be careful because the baseball coaches. I don't know, you're good, you're good. good. It sounds like you're it's good. neck and neck. Look, you can only be a baseball player for so long. That's true. I would imagine, Dad, you have to be quite proud. What I'm most proud about with Brian in general is he just goes for it. I mean, what do you want to see from your kids? You want to see them thrive. Yeah, I mean, you know that's a testament to good parenting, too. Uh, I mean, that's what I hear. When we come back, the spotlight is on LGBTQ youth and the generational shift of coming out in this digital world. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now we focus on the future and the advances the next generation is making when it comes to coming out. I sat down with five students at the University of Central Florida to hear about their experiences with coming out. Take a look. They're called Gen Z, but many young adults proudly embrace five other letters, LGBTQ. I'm a lesbian. I'm gay. I'm bisexual. I'm transgender. I'm queer. A recent Gallup poll found that among Gen Z adults, those between the ages of 18 and 25, about 21% identify as LGBTQ. 21%, it's one in five. When you heard that number, what was your reaction? I really wasn't surprised. Our generation isn't really scared to actually say that we're part of the community and we're actually proud of who we are. With the help of Campus Pride, a national group supporting LGBTQ college students, we gathered this group of Gen Zers, Eddie, Nick, Marcus, Sierra, and Mary. They go to the University of Central Florida and are part of the first generation to totally grow up in a digital world. Social media, how important was that to you when you were younger? Oh, social media, it was like everything to me because it really helped me form a sense of myself. I remember writing in my diary as a kid that I had a crush on a boy just over and over and over just to pray that eventually I'll convince myself that I do. And I got introduced to these online communities and I finally saw, oh wait, I'm not a freak. 
There are people out there who feel the same way that I do. And that realization saved my life. And I don't want to add more stress to your day, but I love you. They could also see themselves reflected in traditional media, movies, and TV shows. Growing up and seeing even the smallest bits of representation in like LGBTQ plus characters and everything of that sort is just made me feel, you know, like not alone. And it made me feel like kind of understood. And perhaps no endorsement had a greater impact than the one delivered by the Supreme Court in 2015. Now to that historic Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage across the land. All of it creates a sense of belonging that mental health experts say is vital. The messaging that Gen Zers have is like it's okay to be who you are and to love who you love and to talk about that and celebrate that. A majority of LGBTQ Gen Zers say they're bisexual, and among those five letters, a growing number of young people identify as queer, which is perhaps most simply defined is not straight. I present as a boy, but I love pink or I love like feminine things, but at the same time, I could also like masculine things and I don't need to be in that set, like binary. For your generation, it's easier to come out than say my generation, but it's not easy, is it? No, no definitely mm -mm. not. For me, coming out was always sort of like bouncing off a brick wall and bouncing off the brick wall and bouncing and bouncing until eventually I can make a dent. I feel like there's this huge disconnect. Oh, being queer is like a trend, but these are people's identities. These are people really putting themselves on the line and putting themselves in a place where they could be in danger. All of them grew up in more conservative communities in Florida. It's a state that's making headlines this year for passing legislation that prohibits classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity for many younger students. We're gonna make sure that parents are able to send their kid to kindergarten without having some of this stuff injected into their school curriculum. What critics call the don't say gay law. Now you're just trying to control and minimize us and just kind of shove us back even more, but I think it only just kind of makes us push back harder. So when you look at the future, do you have optimism? Yes, definitely. We have always been here and now we are saying we're here. We are letting the world know that we accept ourselves, we love ourselves, and we're not going to back down. One major reason it's easier for younger people to come out, society is more accepting. 70% of Americans now approve of same-sex marriage. And here's a really important stat about acceptance. LGBTQ youth who have at least one accepting adult in their lives were 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt. According to Harvard's Life in Rural America surveys, less than 5% of the rural population identifies as LGBTQ. But Bastrop Cattle Company is working to change that. The grass-fed beef brand has taken TikTok by storm, amassing millions of views and likes about their grass-fed beef while influencing a new generation of farmers within the ranching community. Take a look. The first video that I made ended up going viral for about 9 million views on TikTok. And it's just me yelling at cows. Normally me being sassy with them because some of them are just real troublemakers. Come on girls! I did not expect that people would be so interested in uh, just a gay man yelling at cows. That gay man is Max Kremke. He, along with husband Brandon Raisler and Patty Jacobs, own Bass Strip Cattle Company. This trio is changing outdated stereotypes of cattle ranchers. Their farmhouse is even pink. I think that rural Texas gets painted with a broad brush, that it's going to be uh, intolerant or, or traditional. I get the sense uh, from a lot of people in certain areas that they don't see that many uh, uh, gay ranchers around. And it is, uh, it is really interesting because uh, everybody's been very warm and accepting. There are some decent numbers of women that are going back into farming and ranching. And there's always been kind of a history of women ranching in Texas. That'll be nice. The ranch has been in the family since 1970, and I grew up here. Patty left the ranch for two decades after college, but then decided to come back home, taking over the family ranch in 2006. Patty and brother Cleve transitioned it to an entirely grass-fed operation. <laughs> The calves are born here. 
So the majority of the animals have always been here their entire lives. They're really bred to live on this ranch and get the most out of the grass that we have here. As Patty and Cleve were growing their herd, Cleve died of lung cancer in 2013. Patty needed more hands to run the farm. I ran for office and met uh, Max's husband, Brandon, and pretty soon Brandon was helping me with the business, even though we lost the campaign. And we just kind of grew it from there, and then Max came into it about three years ago. City boy, uh, never ever thought that I would be living out in rural Texas. Hey Elijah. Hey big boy. Hey big boy. I met my husband about 11 years ago, and he was from a small town, and I'm from Austin. We immediately fell in love. We knew that we were the right one for each other, and it was uh, so interesting because he's always been really passionate about cattle ranching. <laughs> Bastrop's cattle are raised without hormones or antibiotics on chemical-free pastures. The trio selectively breed the animals to thrive in central Texas, from enduring drastic weather changes to scavenging for local plants. And we call our cows hustlers um, because we expect them to hustle. They eat the grass, but they also eat the oak leaves, they eat a uh, cactus. The labor intensive process yields beef that is well marbled and tender despite the cow's grass only diet. For nearly a decade, Bastrop sold most of its premium meat to restaurants. The demand shifted radically during the pandemic. We had to pivot within a two week period to 100% direct and then we were backed up six months. We didn't know if we could ship beef. I was delivering all of the beef myself. Now we're in a completely different area. We're boxing it and we're shipping it and we could get it anywhere in Texas in two days. Max's background in film production and marketing helped support their new venture. He built a new website and launched a social campaign targeted at a new demographic. A lot of places that we saw do uh, kind of like what I'd consider to be like man meat. We actually kind of chose to go a different way on ours by being more inclusive in terms of our brand language and how we try to appeal. We try to direct it more towards the woman in the household because they're the ones who are going to be making the decision about what goes in that freezer. Customers really love knowing where their beef comes from and so they keep on coming back and we're happy to have them. But it's not only sales that have grown for Bastrop, their ranch is famous on TikTok. Max's TikTok account is more than 4 million likes. He's hoping to inspire a new generation of more diverse farmers by sharing his love for agriculture. You my sweet, sweet boy. You let me rub around on your horns. You let me go under the chin. Whenever somebody's like, oh, uh, you really inspire me as a gay man doing this, which I'm not trying to do that. I like, I'm not setting out to be like, I'm an icon and a hero for being a rancher. What I think is really important is just trying to normalize that idea that normalize the fact that it's not just one type of person that's yeah. involved. It's everybody is invited. All of the women, the gays, everybody else getting involved in agriculture is actually providing a lot of new energy and new innovation. Unlike Max, Brandon prefers to stay out of the spotlight and focus on caring for the herd. The trio built a business that feels more like a family. We kind yeah. of take care of each other and believe in the same sort of the same sort of ethics and moral. Patty hopes that Max and Brandon will eventually take over the business as the two share Patty's vision of farming her family's land for years to come. There's something special about this. It's not just that I'm a woman and he's gay. We want something that we can feel comfortable with, that we can steward on through and continue doing it, where it's a, a brand that you've heard about for a really long time and you know that you can depend on it. Our Pride special continues after the break.
Welcome back. From lipstick to eyeshadow, beauty products allow users to feel like better versions of themselves. And now the world of beauty is more expansive with the rise of gender-inclusive beauty brands. Take a look. For years, the beauty industry has marketed products towards an exclusive audience. So how come you're putting lipstick on? The girls always got to look good. But now, gender-inclusive beauty brands are redefining beauty standards beyond the binary. When we speak about gender inclusivity um, and gender expansive identities, what we really mean by that is that anybody can express any aspect of their self as they'd like regarding gender. Laura Kraber was inspired by her experience as a parent to create We Are Fluid in 2018. I've just been so inspired by the young people who are leading a societal shift and creating a more expansive understanding of gender identity. I just felt like now was the time to create a brand that was welcoming to people of all skin tones, all gender expressions, all gender identities. Laura was on to something. 69% of Gen Z and millennials are looking for more brands that offer gender-inclusive products, according to a report from Ypulse, a youth marketing research company. Now many are turning frustration into fuel to start their own beauty brands. I was inspired to create Dragon Beauty after being a little frustrated that the beauty industry wasn't reflecting someone like myself as a trans woman in the marketplace. I feel like beauty really needs to match the world. The world is colorful and people come in a, an array of a spectrum and in different sizes, shapes, ethnicities, you name it. Patrick Starr created One Size to encourage kindness and expression. It's important for me to share the voices of the unseen and the unheard in my community because once upon a time, I was one of those customers. I was scared to buy makeup. I felt like I was going to be judged. I felt like no one was going to accept me. The One Size brand mission is to represent everyone through beauty. Makeup is a one size fits all. To keep up with high demand, these brands are shifting their focus to incorporate inclusivity and representation from products to marketing and beyond. We really need to champion those that are unconventional and different. I think we're all tired of seeing the same type of model again and again. I think we're living through a moment where that is really changing. And I think in 10 years, we'll see even more change. For me, it's so important to have trans models, to have models of color, to have a workspace that reflects room that I want to be in. For these founders, personal experience led to products that are changing the world of beauty for the better. I was wanting to look in the mirror and see the woman that I felt inside. These beauty products really helped me find who I was and have always been my protective armor in facing the world. I wasn't born like this, I didn't get to wake up like this, but if I can put on a little bit of sequins and lashes and lipstick, I can really feel confident in being who I really want to be, and that's for everybody too. Through their efforts, gender-inclusive brands are redefining what beauty should be and reminding the world how beauty should make you feel. Thank you for joining me this half hour to celebrate Pride is Universal. I'm Joe Fryer. We'll see you next time on Today All Day. Time for a special Make Ahead Monday. If you're firing up the grill today, we have some creative and delicious ways to use all of your leftovers. You see them, you know them, you love them. Here to help us is chef and owner of Pig Beach in Brooklyn, Matt Abdu. Matt, welcome yes, to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. We're let's, super excited today. Let's dig in. All right, we're first starting <laughs> off with some hot dog hash. Yes. We've got all these leftovers. You don't know what to do with them. We're going to do a little fun and unique twist on it all. Take your leftover hot dogs. Okay. We're going to slice them really thin, sear them up. In a pan, we're going to start with some chopped Good. or cut up potatoes. Easy put them right enough. on in. Yep. This couldn't be easier. Yeah. So potatoes go in the pan, onions, pepper, some garlic, all just goes right on in. Okay. You're going to cover it, cook it for about 10 minutes. Will Al Roker sneak into your house and eat your food while, uh, you, while you cook? Only if you're lucky. Okay. Oh my God, it's one of the greatest things ever. So you're going to okay. cover this, let yeah. this cook, uh, season with a little bit of salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. Until the potatoes are nice and tender, they're going to start to take on a little bit of color. Did you just make this up? I've never heard of this. I, you know what? I, it was kind of inspired by that Peruvian dish. It was like hot dogs and french fries, mm. but it was like, what way oh, can you do? Yes. I wanted to do like a breakfast, lunch, dinner kind I of thing it. with all these leftovers. Love it. So the potatoes are going to cook with the onions, and you have all these leftover hot dogs sliced about a quarter of an inch thick, okay. browned up like you do in fried bologna. Okay. Toss all mm. those in with some sliced scallions to sort of finish and garnish. 
I love and just give it a good mix. So this is our all-purpose barbecue seasoning. I've made this a few times before for you guys. Okay. It's just a, a great thing to use as a seasoner for the hash or for your ribs or for burgers, chicken, whatever you want to do. What's in it? And we got some cumin, granulated garlic, granulated onion, hatch chili, salt, pepper, garlic, paprika, and some thyme. Ooh. Ooh. I need all those. Bottom all. is delicious. We do. This is yeah. Yeah. Oh, Am I allowed to say that? Pigmeatnyc.com. And we're just going to season the top it's of it with a little bit of sprinkle of that all-purpose barbecue seasoning. Okay. And breakfast is on the table with some leftover hot dogs. This is an A plus. Out all right. Out rock out and roll. All right. So we got some leftover burgers. Yes, sir. What can we do? All right. We're going to take them. We're going to crumble them all up as you have them seen in this pan here. Mm -hmm. This is roughly about uh, five hamburgers or so. And then we're going to take the peppers, cut off the tops, right? And some onions and some garlic, and you're just going to saute them all until they're nice and soft and translucent. It. You're gonna dump that in the bowl. Yeah. Uh, some bulgur wheat. We have bulgur oh, wheat that's mm -hmm. been just soaked, strained. That's going to go in the bowl. So that's kind of your binder? Yeah, this is kind of inspired from a dish I grew up eating called kusa. My father used to make it for me all the time. Yeah, Dad, kusa in a yeah. soft pepper form. Uh, we're going to add some cumin, some zaatar, some salt, some pepper. Mm. Mm. And we have some uh, basil and mint. We're going to mix all that in there. And then for a little, yeah, give it a good old stir, stir for me. And uh, you kind of have a little cheese and stuffed ah, pepper. So we're going to mm -hmm. put some Parmesan in there. Some eggs to work as the binder that's going to kind of hold it all together when mm -hmm. it cooks. And last but not least, a little bit of Greek yogurt. Oh, so the Greek yogurt is going to give it a nice creamy flavor profile. And also, mm -hmm. that yogurt goes really well with the meat. Yeah, um, it's not dry. Yeah, it's, well, that's, very that's the hope. The cheese, the yogurt, the eggs mm -hmm. makes it all really mm -hmm. nice and moist. We're going to stuff it in these peppers. Right. We're going to put a can of fire roasted tomatoes on the bottom of it, oh. which you can get at the grocery yeah, store. Yeah, They're absolutely mm -hmm. delicious. Cover it with foil. Bake for about 45 minutes to an hour until the peppers are tender and the peppers are cooked through. Garnish it with this little. Uh, tzatziki, sort of New York City white sauce, wow. I call it. Okay. Recipeontoday.com. Mm. No. Check it out. It's absolutely fun, delicious, it's great delicious. way of using up leftover burgers. I've fantastic. never thought of reusing hamburgers well, in that way. Well, most people don't. And why, and why would you, right? What a great idea. All right, so moving on, finally, dilly dilly. we got yes. some pasta salad dilly for you, girl. Uh, I'm excited for this. You growing up some vegetables like me, you're at home for any sort of holiday, you got some leftover grilled mm -hmm. vegetables. There's so many different things you can do with it. What I love during the summertime is making pasta salad. I grew up having this in my fridge mm -hmm. for my mom. Super simple. You have leftover peppers, zucchini, onions, some grilled corn. We're going to take it all and Throw pour right this in. right into all a right. pound of tricolor uh, pasta or whatever pasta you like. Mm -hmm. We're going to make a really simp simple and easy Italian vinaigrette, some red wine vinegar, some olive oil, some oregano, uh, salt, pepper, chili flake, a little bit of honey. Gives it a little nice You're sweetness. Good with yes. Well, thank you. It means the world to me. <laughs> that is And job. then we're just going to add in some tomatoes. Some Perfect. feta cheese. Oh. And, I love the feta and, olive oh, combo. Me too, oh, girl. Man. And then these are kalamatas. You can really use black olives or whatever olive you really like. Perfect. And then we're going to dump onto it that Italian seasoning. Oh, Italian man. vinaigrette. Oh. Give it a nice big old stir. The great thing about this is it'll keep in your refrigerator for the full week. I was going to say, how far yeah. advance could you, you make? Well, it's better if you make it the night before. That oh way the pasta God. really gets to marinate it better in that vinaigrette. It's good, oh, right? Wow. Simple. This my mom, Ma, I love it. We used to grow up eating this. My mom would have a whole Tupperware of this in the fridge in the summertime. Oh, yeah. Every meal she'd pull it out. Put it on the table with whatever we're eating in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Take this with you to the out. beach. So Why not? You know, yeah. Yeah. Anywhere. It's Warm or cold. It's fresh. Or, yeah. It's light. It's just such a great, uh, simple, easy thing to do with some leftover veggies. Mm. It is time for a media edition of Make Ahead Monday. Mm. And Jordan Andino, mm. chef and owner of Flip Siggy here in New York, is going to show us how to make a pork adobo. How do you How do you start? Yeah, you know, so that's why. So I have a glove right here just for in terms mm. of time mm. management. But right here you have actually a pork butt or a pork shoulder. So what, what I like about this is that it's a delicious cut of meat, but it just takes some time to braise. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's not that intimidating. Notice it's really big. All you gotta do, it's typically boneless and skinless. Okay. So all you, all you gotta do is just pretty much cut it up into maybe one and a half, two inch cubes. It doesn't need to be pretty. You kind of just go at it and just make large cubes so that it just cuts the cooking time down from like three hours to maybe two hours instead. Oh my gosh, so, so super good. simple. Yeah, you know, you just have the, you know, chunks like this as you guys can see it's not you know too crazy okay and then once you, once you break down your big piece you'll have kind of your nice bowl of like already chopped up meat right there you guys are enjoying it already <laughs> so, so what are you adding see. what are you adding yeah, where is all this flavor the coming flavor from? is coming like before it starts to braise yeah so you know um all you have to do it's pretty simple at that point once it's cut um let's pretend the stove top is right here we have my pot all you got to do is add a little bit of oil to, to the base, and this is going to help you saute and caramelize everything and, okay. and garner a lot more flavor from the minced garlic, which I just threw in. And then after that, once the garlic browns, you're going to throw in your pork shoulder that you just cut. So you're just going to put that in and just let that really 
kind of brown and just get some and more flavor so and a little bit of caramelization. It's not too hard. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yes. No, it's it perfect. Is so delicious. Yeah, no, no. And it's, it's, it's supposed to be just delicious and easy. After that, the flavor that you guys are getting comes from a couple of things. It's going to be your oyster sauce, okay. which oh. is like, you know, seafood oyster flavored yeah. sauce along with a little bit of sriracha, which is kind of your, mm. you're going to give you your hot and sweetness right there. But really what I want to concentrate on the flavors are these three ingredients right here. You have your swan sea soy, and then your dati putti vinegar, and then your mushroom soy Where sauce. Where do you get those? My grandmother's going to kill me. These are her, the three combination recipe to make the adobo, and the true Filipinos oh, out there will really appreciate these. Oh, secret is out. These. Yeah. <laughs> that vinegar, Secret's out. Yeah, so all you got to do, mm. yeah, basically all you got to do is just put, you know, pour all this in there. It's super simple. You just pour it in. It's about like three quarters cup of the swan soy, three quarters cup of the dark mushroom soy. Mm. Those have a lot of sodium in it. So you don't need to add any salt. That's going to give you that awesome flavor. And then that tanginess that you guys are tasting is from this cane sugar vinegar from the Philippines oh. here. Oh, yeah. Where can you buy that? So, you know, there's a couple of uh, like, you know, we'll call them Asian marts all around like Queens, Jersey, and um, in the East Village, um, you know, it's, and also Chinatown. It's hard to find, but once you do find it, these are ingredients that you always want to keep so stocked. Good. Because it's so delicious yeah. and it's a great replacement yeah. for just your regular kind of white okay. vinegar. Well, it I'm is gonna, so good. But you know, Jordan, I'm yeah, enjoying so this once over you, rice, but I know you can also, once you're left with all these leftovers, you can turn it into this amazing torta. Yum. Yeah, you're right. You know, so you know, once it's done, you know, you have your beautiful plate like this, which you guys are having, and then you have your torta. So your torta, which you guys have right there, mm. are you know, that's how we get to the leftover Mondays because you make a big Big, you know, batch of this two-pound pork. You got to build a sandwich. So I have this. I have mine right here. All you guys got to see right there is you have your, you know, your toast and then your meat, and it's already made. All you got to do is just start building it. So you have your bottom bun, oh a little bit of mayo, a little bit of hot sauce. But the really, the real concentration here are your pickled onions. So I started with very simple pickled onions. It's just salt, sugar, white vinegar. Boil it, throw in some red onions, and you get that beautiful pink color oh, there. so good. Yeah, so Jordan, add like a really nice tang. Hey, Go real ahead. quick, real quick, yeah, because pork is so hard to cook for some people. And, and I got to say, I'm, I'm Cuban, so like Filipinos, we eat a lot of pork. This is amazing. How do you know when your pork's done? Okay, that's a great question. So I'm going to show you guys what, what that's supposed to look like. So as you guys can see, you, you know because of how tender everything is. So all you got to do is just... Cook it, oh, cook it, braise it for pretty much like two hours, and then you're going to get this. And I'll give you a nice little reveal real quick. It should look something like that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So any of you guys can see apart. it. It just really just falls apart. So here's how you know. All, you know that everything's ready. You just got to take your pork, put it on a plate, and then you're going to see how easy it is. You just take a fork or two and just oh, press it. Wow. There you go. That's why it's so And you're going to see good. how quickly it is to pull because – that's how you know it's done. Two hours, medium heat, and look at that. It just okay. comes apart Jordan, like that. Jordan, you can barely we are out hold of time, but we, and we um, have happy plates. We, we, we can't have stop eating. Plate. We've yeah. eaten all of our I've food. had sauce all over my face. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. 
Here to share some delicious Korean cuisine, celebrity chef, entrepreneur, Jet Dela. What's happening, guys? Hey. Chef. So good to be oh, here. Man. So good to uh, have you here. We awesome. love short ribs. Yes, we do. And especially but Korean make short them. ribs. Mm. And I think it's really great for Make Ahead Mondays because mm -hmm. it's one of those dishes, it is maximum flavor, minimum ingredients. Can you put garlic in soy yes, sauce? Yes, sir, I will. So garlic, we know, is oh, uh, a pungent. Uh, I'm going to do brown sugar around you right. for a little mm. sweet. And then we'll do sesame oil. Sesame oil. Yeah, and that's going to give you aroma. You go there. Right. And then here's the secret ingredient to Korean barbecue, a little sweet. Uh, this also helps break down the toughness of the meat. Um, apple pears. Apple really? pears. Apple really? pears is what you want to do. So yeah. it has to be an apple. Like you, it, know, you can't just use any kind of no, pear. No, no, you could use any kind of pear. But you know what? This helps break down meat. So things like uh, pineapple and things like papaya juice, that'll yeah. work too. So do you want to marinate that? Yep. I have one ready to go, so we'll swap. I'll you get marinated. You come because you put us to work. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you know, many hands, little work. So ah, like here we thing. go. Uh, marinate four hours to over night because it's a big piece of meat. Mm -hmm. Dab off all the marinade because the marinade's done its job. Get that sizzling. Uh, yes. Craig, you got this? Yes, sir. I'm all this, over it. Uh, cook to your doneness. 125 is medium rare internal, but that, that becomes that sliced up. I just want to pick up that up. whole bone and it just eat it. It becomes so that. Oh, Look at and, that. So now that's Monday. <laughs> that's Monday. We still have the rest of the week here. And we so have better things to do. Come on so over to Tuesday. Are you ready? I'm ready for Let's Tuesday. Let's pop Tuesday. So are you ready to cook with me? Let's switch. All right, what do you need all right, to do? All right, garlic in a hot pan. Wait, first of all, what are we making? Yeah, so we're going to make a, a Korean chop chai noodles. Just think about it as lo mein, okay. like Korean style. Yum. So let's do garlic, okay. and you can just put just all the veggies in. in all the as veggies. long as the oil is hot and the garlic is ready to go. Carrots, green peppers, and onions. Onions, you got okay. yeah. So uh, all the veggies, and then remember that that Monday's meat yes. becomes Tuesday's noodles. Yum. So that's gonna go. We'll stir that up. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, I should probably that not eat out of it and stir. No, I do that all the time. <laughs> I mean that's how you know what I'm saying. So um, noodles, don't freak out. Uh, rice noodles, egg noodles. But can, this could be Any pasta. Kind? I just want you to cook it al dente. Okay. Make sure it's not overcooked because it's oh, got to so still yummy. ride in the pan a little bit. Okay. You want to stir that and up. And I just tried it, and there's, the seasonings are amazing. So what are you putting in it? Oh, you got, extra... again, this is for, for Korean flavors. Yeah. Soy sauce is salt. Okay. Right? Just think about it as Try salt. Try it, guys. Sesame okay. oil is aroma. Okay. I don't want a lot. Salt, and just a pinch aroma. of sugar to take the edge off. The so vegetables good. carry a lot of flavor. Look how healthy that Look is. Look at this. Mm. You know, that's where you meat is on the side. First day meat was in the middle. I like to serve it warm, but you know, it makes a phenomenal pasta so salad. Good. It's a really nice you know cold I mean? salad. Just yeah. remember, the secret though there is uh, don't overcook those noodles. Okay. okay. Yeah, make sure those noodles are super al dente, even pasta. Now, fried rice. Fried rice. I've always wanted to, to learn to make fried rice the, at home. I'm going to tell you the absolute secret to fried rice. Okay. Whisk those eggs. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put aromatics. We've done this before. You've seen it once before. All okay. the veggies. But the real secret, guys, to making fried rice without using a lot of oil, put those eggs in if right, you don't mind, right Dylan. Okay. And I'm going to show you. Don't let them cook all the way. When the eggs are wet, uh -huh. you're going to put the really? rice right yeah. into wet eggs. Because ma egg has this magic ability to coat the rice because wow. it's got protein in okay. it. It's got a little natural fat in it. Watch. Look at the bottom of the pan. It doesn't stick. Wow. So it's egg. And once this comes up, mm -hmm. I'll season. You stir and yeah, I season. Okay. That's an excellent Oyster one. sauce. You Oyster sauce. Yep. Okay. Soy sauce. I've got the meat and the, remember the Korean barbecue short ribs? Yes. And the vegetables. Once the oh, egg cooks this. up, looks what it, look what it becomes. This is amazing. I'll do some this here. This I'll do some here. And you know what it is? It's full of flavor and not salt. Like it just, That's it tastes, exactly. you know what I mean? Asian, good Asian foods shouldn't be salt bombs, right? This we is, should be balancing out vegetables, mm. sweetness, five flavors. Hot, sour, salty, sweet, I'm savory. And hot, sour, That's salty, amazing. sweet, savory, big veggies. That's how you do it. So I love rotisserie chicken. I feel like it's the ultimate ultimate shortcut. It's packed with protein and obviously you can enjoy it as a standalone with vegetables, but I'm going to show you two ways to sort of take it to the next level. So you would slice the top, you take back the skin and you take those breasts and using your hands, you're just going to shred them so you get lots of small little pieces. Okay. And one rotisserie chicken will yield about three cups of that chicken breast. Mm -hmm. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to make, you can see these over here. We're gonna make mm, Asian style chicken lettuce wraps. And I'm gonna bring you over to my stove and we're gonna get cooking. Okay. So oh, here yeah, I, I have, camera this action. is, <laughs> this is um, one onion that was finely diced and then I just sauteed it about five minutes. Mm -hmm. 
and the party starts. I add in some hoisin sauce, okay. a little bit of reduced sodium soy sauce. Mm -hmm. This is rice wine vinegar. These are just, you could see these powders, garlic powder and ginger, ginger powder. You can use fresh, but I want to make this super simple yes. and it comes together lickety split. And you can get this that hoisin is, sauce at Asian markets. I wondered about that. Yes. Can you eat with pho all you the can, time? You can, you can get it at any grocery store. Is it common now? Okay. Hoisin yeah. sauce is yeah. okay. I didn't know. everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. And and what I just added, you see, this is chopped water chestnuts. Ah. It's part of the tuber vegetable family, mm. and it adds like that crisp oh, crunch. crunch. Right. It's mm. so delicious, and it's very, very light. Okay. Scallions, if you're like me, and you absolutely love onion, and a little cashews or peanuts. Yeah. Right. So and you can leave those out if you're allergic. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And you mix this up, and now yeah. we're ready for our chicken. So this is how much chicken I got oh, wow. from that rotisserie, three cups, and you just... Mix this whole thing together, and you let it simmer for about 10, 15 minutes until yeah. everything's hot. And I'm going to bring you back over to the island. Okay. Come on oh, over nice. here. It's so dinner. easy. I like how yeah. it's always in one skillet. That makes it so much easier. Yeah. Yes. And, and they're mm. low carb, they're packed with protein, mm. and guys, right. you could gobble down so many of these, and you'll feel yes. like you're in your favorite Asian restaurant. And you got barbecue yeah. sliders. Ooh, sliders are Okay, good. these are saucy and scrumptious. I'm bringing you back over to my stove now. Okay. This is so funny. Let me clear this. Okay. Okay, don't judge me on my messiness. Are you no, kidding me? That's like an always ready <laughs> set that you, you live in. You don't have our <laughs> food prep staff like Katie Steele are oh doing. So. You're so right. So over here, what I'm doing is... This is going to be um, red wine vinegar. We're going in a totally different flavor direction. Yeah. Now we have soy sauce. Right. This is a can of no salt added tomato sauce. Um, this mm. is the spirit of sloppy joes. I guess we could yeah. call these sloppy joys. Oh, and this is a, like <laughs> a little bit of, uh, that was tomato paste to really bolden up the flavor, mm -hmm. salt and pepper. And guys, as the signature sloppy joe would have it, mm. I'm adding a little bit of yellow mustard. Oh, I didn't know. That's yeah. unexpected. Yeah. Mix it up, mm. and now we have our chicken again. Here we go. Boom. Chicken goes in, and you mix this up. I'm going to bring you back over to my island. Come on, guys. I love this. I feel okay. like we're in her house with her. I know. <laughs> and there you have it. Yum. How Joy, much do I want to feed you right now? Yeah. I wish I, know, I could wish give you a bite. That's, oh. a great, that's a great lunch for anybody. Yeah. Joy Blower, Yum. Bauer, thanks so much. Always Thank good you, to Joy. see you. And for these, yeah, I love that. For these, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, that looks good. For these <laughs> recipes yummy. and more, head to today.com slash food. <laughs>
Our next she was guest. Trying to make it look like she wasn't chewing. She's talking with her mouth full. Uh, our next guest putting a Texas twist on dinner this week. Here to cook up some delicious pork. Chef, owner of Jamali in Fort Worth, Tim Long. You've, so you've been to the show like two dozen times, so you're an old pro at this. But this new restaurant named after your twin daughters. That's right, Jamali. It's my new Italian place that just opened in Fort Worth. All right. Having really? a lot of fun. So make ahead Monday, and it is Monday, <laughs> so we'll make ahead some stuff. <laughs> That's so deep. You know, I mean, this no, is really, this is really genuinely deep stuff. <laughs> so uh, this is a, actually a dish that my wife likes to cook all the time. Oh, so it's pork nice. shoulder that we have in here, bone and pork shoulder. Okay. Uh, make a nice spice rub, rub it really well. This is my pork rub that I, I sell, but you can just find a good barbecue rub. What's in your, oh, wow. what's in your rub? It's guajillo chilies, fresh rosemary, thyme, salt, wow. pepper, cumin. It's really delicious. Okay. And then we add some poblano chilies that are just raw. Okay. Right. Same with the onion, chopped white onion. Then we're adding a can of chipotle chilies because we like to have it hot and spicy. We do like it hot and spicy. And then a little bit of water. We cover it. It takes six hours. And that's it. You that's can it. Walk away. And so then when it's ready, it comes out like this. I've also made some potatoes that we boil. Then we smash them and then grill them on a plancha. Really? Really quickly, simple, what really do you call, delicious. What do you call them, those potatoes? Plancha potatoes. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's move you. Don't come here now. What are you doing? So the next right. dish that we're going to make. <laughs> and you said you got she the leftover pork. She already said you got the leftover pork. Can I tell you something? Tell me something. Dylan, tell him what you just said in my ear. This is the best thing I've ever had. <laughs> this, this quesadilla is unbelievable. They should be on that show, the best thing I ever ate. So let's okay. explain what you're doing. So let's do it. So here we got a saute pan. I've got some... Uh, Bell peppers, we're gonna add in here like this. It's fresh. Some chopped onions, yeah. Really See, good. you know, vegetables are like people, right? They come in different sizes, they come in different flavors, they come in different personalities. And you wanna make sure that when you saute the vegetables, that uh -huh. you give it time to develop. Meaning, we don't want them to be raw, but we, want to, we don't want to cook them all the way because we want the crunch of the vegetable. That's why, left. is that why it tastes so fresh? That's right. So then oh, we so take a it? tortilla. Okay. Let's spread some goat cheese on here like this. Goat cheese. That's and now you're going to take is. the beans and spread well, it on this side. Eating goat cheese. And then you puree the beans? <laughs> puree the beans, spread on this side. I've this never, side. I, I'm a horrible. I know, it's, it's hard to develop 50 50, but it's like. <laughs> puree with goat cheese. Then we That's put, why it's so good. We put the mixture on like this. Okay. And then we're going to fold it in half. Look, guys. After. You Did I do too cheese. many beans? No, you can actually you can make have these. I know, that's what I'm saying. It's Hold life it changing. Half. Oh, you're right about that. And press it down. Right. Now, and then just swap it take the there. brush and oh, brush it with a little bit of yeah. canola oil. Like so. Now you can do this outside, okay? Okay. If you're at the house, you can do it on the grill. Now put it okay, right on the grill. I play like I did that perfectly. You obviously did it well, perfectly. Well, you put the wrong side so, down. Then, yeah, so you put it. I'm gonna, you know, it's going to look great. Don't worry about me. You just do you. That's the most cooking you've <laughs> done in two years. That's the, best, that's the most cooking I've ever seen her do on the show, by the yeah. way. Now let me go back <laughs> to chewing. Yes. Chanel back to eating. eats really well. Tony, it finishes, and then you want to put a little bit of the creamy jalapeno sauce. Oh, like, all the jalapeno blades. Okay, blade. we only yeah. have a minute left, but we've got ramen noodles to make now. Okay, ramen noodles. So here, same pork, right? Yep. We whip this egg. We okay. add a little salt and pepper because we're gonna we're gonna dice this egg up later. So we okay. add it in here. Let the egg cook all the way through. So we're gonna roll that around. Okay. A little oil. Don't there. worry about it. It'll just keep cooking. Okay. Then we take the pork shoulder mm -hmm. and we drop it in this dressing like this. This What's has in that? green onions, garlic, a little bit of soy sauce, and we mm. let it sit for five minutes. Perfect. Then we take ramen noodles, the cheap ramen noodles that you buy at the store, right? Nice. Cook them. Don't worry about the seasoning. Take the noodles, put them here like this okay. after they're cool. We got some beef sprouts. We got some sake. Mm -hmm. We got some rice wine vinegar. Mm. We got some nori. Wow, right and here. all those Asian flavors. And then you take flavors. your egg and you oh, slice you it up after it's cooked. Okay. And it gets like this. You top that on top. And then you take your pork that's been sitting in the juice. Mm. You mix it up. Okay. You act like a great oh, American hero. Good. And, and then it you totally eat it. Changes How the is flavor it? of everything. This is delicious. It's nice. So three Thank different ways. Make thanks it Monday. Thank you so much for these recipes and more. Log on Chef to today.com slash so good. Yeah.
the weather's warming up, the last thing you want to do is to spend hours inside cooking. That's no fun. Katie Lee Beagle, co-host of Food Networks. The Kitchen has a simple sheet pan recipe. It got more than a million what? views when she first posted yes. it. Is this a viral recipe? Wow. I mean, people love salmon, it turns out. True. And they love sheet pan recipes. All you have to do, chop up some broccoli and some sweet potatoes. You want your sweet potatoes to be in cubes. And your broccoli can be, you know, a little bit on the medium side. Sure. Because you want everything to cook at the same time oh. on the sheet pan. Okay. Uh -huh. So instead of buying fillets of salmon, we're going to just do one big piece. And do you so ask them all at the, at the supermarket to de-skin it? For this recipe, I do. Most of the time, I cook salmon with, with the, the skin, skin on. on. But for this one, because you'll see we're going to add a sauce to it, I like it skinless. Okay. So I'm going to add a little bit of oil to our Super veg. Simple. Yep. And some salt and pepper. Salt and all I did was yep. and pepper that salmon up for me. Ooh, fun. So that's all we're doing to it. And then we're going to make our sauce because this is a honey mustard. Ooh. I didn't even tell y'all what we were making. Honey, <laughs> honey mustard oh, salmon yum. with sweet potatoes and broccoli. Oh, so I've got gosh. equal parts of honey and I like to use a, a like coarse a mustard. Coupon. Yes, nice, yes. <laughs> Very good. Scent. Speaking yeah. of the Paris test, right? You're getting yeah, ready totally. for your travels. Exactly. <laughs> and then mix it together. This goes right on top of the salmon. I mean, so simple. And some of it's gonna run off and that's okay because we're gonna mix that with our veggies. So Willie, take those veggies mm -hmm. and scatter them scatter. all around. Can I touch them with yeah. The, Oh, protocol yeah, nowadays. So. You washed your hands. Yeah. yeah. I washed earlier. All right, so that's going to go into the oven. Oh, and I put parchment paper on because that makes our cleanup a lot easier. That's Remote. smart. Oh, that's yes. Very smart. Yes, yeah. then you're barely, you won't have to use Scrape any it. elbow cream. Yeah. yeah. All right, so put that in the oven, 425 degrees. It comes out like this. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's very easy. We love it. How Iris long, how long for 425? Too. About 25, 30 minutes. Now, if you want to do this in fillets, cook your broccoli and sweet potatoes for about 10, 15 minutes first, then add your salmon fillets and cook it the rest of the way. Okay. Because it'll be a different cook time. All right, so you want to have some leftovers for lunch of yes, that we salmon. Do. We're going to make a little salmon salad here with a lemon caper vinaigrette. Oh, I love caper so Me much. Too. Yes, Me so too. we've got our Very lemon. Let's put a little wraps. zest in mm. there and some capers and Dijon mustard. Mm. Salt and pepper it up. Sure. Little splash of white wine vinegar here. Wow. Whisk it, whisk it, whisk it. And then we're going to come down here to our salad. How beautiful. I've just got bib lettuce. I've got thinly sliced celery in here. I've always got celery in my fridge. Some cucumbers go in. Good cutting, Jen. You know, you can kind of just use good. what you have. No, that's you good. Said that. No, that's really and, uh, good. <laughs> okay. Jenna, you said you don't cook much. You're doing a great no, job. Well, I, I assemble. Cucumbers. Assemble. And I okay. chop. Mm -hmm. All right. We got chives. By the way, does parsley. your daughter eat cucumbers? Not really. Okay. No, I she can't will. get a vegetable in She her. will. Occasionally sweet potatoes, occasionally avocado. Okay. All right, so we're going to add our salmon in here. You just flake it up after it comes out. And you can also use canned salmon for this if you didn't make the recipe. You okay. know, canned salmon's a great thing to have around. If you want to add these veggies to it, you can. If not, have it right on its own. Looks Ooh, beautiful. Add the dressing too. Wow. to it. I've got some down here for you guys. Yeah, we're coming oh, to thank taste. Thank you very much. Taste. Did you get one though? Have That's... a bite. This Where's is yours? mine. <laughs> she has I, the bowl. Like, right out of the bowl. I like large portions of salad. <laughs> I call it my trough salad. I just, you just eat straight out get of in it. There, huh? Yeah. <laughs> guys, welcome to The Boost. It is Global Running Day and we're sharing stories of runners who are defying the odds, they're breaking records and inspiring others in the process. First up, we have a dad sprinting into the record books by running races with his quintuplets. Take a look. He earned his first <laughs> two records pushing his quintuplets through a 10K and a marathon. It started as a way to celebrate their first birthday and how far they'd come as a family. Okay, three years later, with the kids now older and heavier, <laughs> uh, Chad recently completed his third race, a half marathon, while holding a sign that read, anything is possible. We're gonna meet Chad's wife and kids in a moment, but first, Chad joins us with more on the touching inspiration behind his mission to break another world record. Oh, look, oh, the gang's all The there. gang's all together. I love hi, it. Hi, Chad, how are you? We're all doing well. 
Okay, you got to talk to us about this because Savannah and I are blown away. <laughs> 240 pounds of toddler is a lot. We each have two and we can push, we can barely Can't push them up. Just give us a little bit of a feeling of what it's like to run and push those kids. Well, I don't want to downplay, you know, just raising kids alone with, with all you moms. So that that's the, the biggest feat right there. But pushing the stroller, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> It's a lot more uh, challenging than it was four years ago when I first did these. Uh, so pushing them now, like I'm, I'm getting a little bit older. Kids are getting heavier and taller, so it, it was pretty difficult. But I mean, I gotta tell you, I have so many logistical questions. I mean, just throwing your kids in the back of the Honda yeah. to go to like Target is a feat in our family. Yeah. Did you bring snacks? What about this? I'm thirsty. I gotta go potty. Da 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 da. How did you manage all that for a long run like that? Yeah. So it takes a lot, a lot of prep for the whole thing, even to get get to the event. You're right. Um, so it's all planned out, and like I gotta have to have backup plan after backup plan. Um, as you can imagine, the there's bribes. Everything, everything comes out out in play during the event. Um, but basically, they they love the stroller. So the, number one, that's the biggest help. They love the stroller. And they love being outside. So that's really helpful, especially now when that they're older and they know what's going on. And then you got to start with the uh, start with the simpler snacks. You know, start with the, the crackers and things like that. And if, if things start to go wrong or they start to get, uh, I don't know, disinterested, then you bring out the the candy and the gummy bears and ice cream after the race. All that. Kind of oh, all well running. All of it. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say. And for hours and hours, you got to have something else to do besides just have snacks. I don't know how y'all are doing it. Amy, we got to talk to you because I mean, this is this is pretty incredible. But all of this, although it's remarkable, it comes from a kind of a bittersweet place. I, I don't know. I don't know if you heard the question. I'm sorry. I think she, we were just asking about you know the reason. There's a really yeah. actual, pretty deep and profound reason that Chad does this, Amy. Mm -hmm. If you want to share that. The reason that he does it. Yeah. He's a uh, He's been athletic since I've known him and I know he loves running and ever since we decided to start having a family, we always talked about wanting to have our kids grow up knowing health and knowing a healthy lifestyle and being active and, and all that comes along with that. And so we're just trying to set a good example for our kids and they already are interested in running themselves and say, We wanna go, we wanna go, so it's yeah. come natural for our kids, so we're glad about that. Chad, why do you why do you keep doing it? You already did it. Like, good for you, but you keep doing it. <laughs> you said I already did it. Yeah, you, I said I said I just wondered why you continue to do it. You've done it. You accomplished it. It was amazing, but you you keep going for one more bite at the apple. <laughs> This is hilarious. I think that's it. You know, so I was trying to do all three of them when they were one years old, and um, and then the pandemic hit and it closed down all the races. So I wanted to get out and finish this last one, and you know I, I was I was like, do I do it? You know, Amy of course cheered me on, and we said, what the heck? Let's go out there and try it. And the kids, at that point, they're begging for it. Dad, let's go do another record. <laughs> and they really know what it all is. Uh, so how am I going to turn that down? You yeah, know? they were yelling, "Run faster! <laughs> Run faster, Daddy!" <laughs> is that your medal? Is your daughter holding your medal behind you? There, we, yes, there we go. Oh, Come on! Oh wow! I know it's kind of chaos there. You got seven kids. It's just amazing that you heard us speak at all. I just want to mention that one of the reasons Chad does it was because he wanted to honor his wife Amy, who carried those fine quintuplets yeah. in their whole journey, yeah. um, which you can read more about. But it's just great to have you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thank you for talking Thank to us. You. All right. Okay. Can you imagine? Say bye, okay. guys. Bye, guys. Bye. See you later. Now to an incredible woman who refused to give up on her passion for running after she was diagnosed with a neurological disorder. Chanel Jones has her story. For many people, running is as simple as putting one foot in front of the other. For Justine Galloway, the best path forward is in reverse, as in running backwards. People always call me show off, and they always say um, you're running the wrong way, which I've heard plenty of times. Justine has been running all her life, mainly forwards, inspired by her dad, Jim. 
My dad actually ran his first marathon the year I was born, New York City Marathon. When I was growing up, he would be training for marathons, and when he would finish his marathon, I'd run around the block with him. What is it about running that you love? One is the connection to my dad, and I just, I saw when it got taken away from him, it's like everyone can run. A Parkinson's diagnosis ended her dad's running career, but it jump-started hers. I continued to run. I ran through high school, kind of, he lived vicariously through me. When Justine's father passed away in 2010, she found solace in the sport and would go on to complete nine marathons. But at 31 years old, while running her third Boston Marathon, she started to feel something strange. I got to mile 18 and was just feeling really off. Two weeks later, I took a fall, and then right after that, my running significantly changed. When you first realized, like, wait a minute, I can't do what I love, what did that feel like? It was really difficult. My left leg wouldn't listen to my brain. It was like my left leg was a piece of wood, and it wouldn't move with my body. And so it would either stay up in the air or go to the side, and it just wouldn't plant when I wanted it to plant, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Justine saw multiple orthopedic specialists and neurologists. She finally got an answer two years later, focal dystonia. Writers can get it who all of a sudden can't write. Musicians, pianists who can't play a song they've always played their whole life will get it. Through physical therapy, Justine found that running backwards was painless. She sprinted into this new chapter, training with a running club and friends who would spot her. In the process, she earned two Guinness World Records for running a half marathon backwards. Well, here I was running backwards a half marathon with my brother and my sister and doing what I love. Justine then decided to try the seemingly impossible, complete the New York City Marathon. I can't even imagine. How do you do the New York City Marathon backwards? It was amazing. It was phenomenal running. Arizona. It was the coolest thing ever to see 50,000 people running after you. She ran for the Michael J. Fox Foundation in honor of her dad. And then this monumental moment, the actor spotted her during the race. At first I thought maybe it was my brother because I was like, okay, I'm just going to lean on to you. And then I realized it was Michael J. Fox. And he, you know, gave me encouragement to move on. Running has taken a whole new meaning for Justine. She no longer runs for time, but instead for fun. So it sounds like you're not going to seek treatment. No. My dad being in and out of hospitals, I just wanted a diagnosis, so I knew it was what I could name it, and then I wanted to continue with my life. Changing course allowed Justine not only to conquer new milestones, but find a new way to continue looking ahead. Keep trying and keep going forward and keep moving. Like, don't let anything stop you, and nothing is impossible. You are about to meet a 100 year old man who has truly gone the distance while showing no signs of slowing down. NBC's Maggie Vespa shares his remarkable story. Runners often strive to outpace time. The nice thing about running at this age. Mike Fremont defies it. Is that there's very little competition. <laughs> at 100, the retired Cincinnati engineer and great grandfather of four logs five to 10 miles three times a week. You are so sweet. His 14 minute mile pace only slowed by starstruck fans. You're an inspiration to a lot of people. Does that feel weird to hear that you're a celebrity? That's a little embarrassing. With 60 marathons under his feet, Mike boasts four world records. Fastest marathons for his age at 80 and 90. Fastest half marathons at 90 and 91. Running started as therapy in his 30s after the loss of his first wife. So I started to run and it, it worked. Decades later, after battling cancer, Mike went vegan and with the encouragement of his second wife, Marilyn, ran marathon after marathon. What do you think is fueling? it. Um, I think he can't quit. <laughs> Proving her point, his other hobby, canoeing. Of course, racing those too. For people who think at 100, a person should be slowing down, what do you say to that? I think they ought to be uh, speeding up. Proof, no matter your age, your best time may still lay ahead.
Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Cincinnati. We've got more stories for you after the break. Stay with us. boost. Our next story spotlights a Minnesota man making an impact through running while battling cancer. Al Roker found out what keeps him motivated and keep him, keeps him pushing forward. Everybody asks me what my favorite race is and I always say it's my next race because I'm not guaranteed that next race. You may be in discomfort today, but enjoy what you're going through. When 61-year-old Tom Perry began running as a teen, he never imagined he'd have more than 2,000 completed races under his belt. Go, Tom. But that's not his only achievement. You have run all 50 states six times. What's this obsession? For me, it was just kind of a fun little thing to start. 2007, I was done with my first time. Thought that was one and done. But I'm a true Gemini. I like to do things twice. So then I did it my third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Over the years, Tom has amassed an impressive running record logging over 100,000 lifetime miles. But three years ago, a visit to the doctor changed his life when he noticed a difference in his finish times. I was slowing down. And so then I'm thinking, okay, it's gotta be fatigue, gotta be overtraining, maybe Lyme disease, maybe anemia, all these things. Get all the testing. Next thing I know, my general physician, Dr. Bergeson, called me to tell you, hey, your PSA is at 92 plus. We have an issue here. Tom was diagnosed with stage three prostate cancer. And then a few months later, learning his cancer had spread. His diagnosis now stage four. When my doctor started off, when he said prostate cancer, my mind kind of went blank. What, what was it like for you? I'm thinking cancer, okay. That doesn't, you know, I just, it didn't, I didn't picture that. You're in great shape, you're healthy, you eat well, no family history of, of, of prostate cancer. You're relatively young. Did it kind of kind of set your back a little bit and go, wait, what? what? It, it did, it was really confusing actually. Like I did everything right in my life. So to have that kind of diagnosis was a total surprise to me because I statistically wasn't in a category that I should be in. And they gave me the diagnosis. Okay, challenge is on. Despite undergoing various cancer treatments, Tom has no plans of slowing down, even pacing and encouraging fellow runners during their races. And just this past May, Tom running his 600th marathon. What motivates you? What keeps you going? I think it's just the fact that, I, I mean, I love to run. I love to help other people. What impresses me about you is you run marathons, cross the finish line, and then you go back and run with people to help them finish. I love that feeling of, you came with me this far, I will get you. I don't care if I have to run three miles or four miles, I will go back and get you and bring you home. I don't care how tired I am, I don't care how fatigued I am, what the weather's like, I will do that. And while others turn to Tom for motivation, he looks to a four-legged friend. Tell me about your four-legged support. 
Oh, little Otto. Oh my God, what a treasure he is. He's my running partner. He was the one that got me off the couch when I had the prostate surgery. He, he takes me out for walks. We take naps together. We do it all together. That little guy is, is just a wonderful aspect of my life and I, and I couldn't thank him enough. For Tom, running is more than a passion. It is his lifeline. We can't control what happens to us in life. Cancer can tell me what I can't do, but it will never tell me what I can do. And that's why I can still run and do the pacing. Boy, that was an incredible story. Coming up next, a Bronx man sharing his inspirational journey ahead of his big marathon. NBC's Joe Fryer shares that story. Jorge Aguilar calls the path ahead of him an obstacle of his own choosing. Any nerves at all? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah right here in my belly. There, there's a burst of butterflies in there. As scary as that 26.2 mile course may sound, Jorge will tell you it's far better than the obstacles that were not of his own choosing, the ones he faced after moving from Costa Rica to the Bronx when he was seven. I thought we were going to the, the land of, of the Simpsons and Mickey Mouse, um, but it was tougher. Those obstacles seemed endless. He and his mom were poor. Jorge was bullied because he didn't speak English, he even faced the threat of deportation. You know, I got, I got jumped and robbed several times as a kid. That stuff carries with you into adulthood, doesn't it? It does, it, it leaves scars. Mental scars that finally started to heal when Jorge started to run. About three years ago, he joined a running club, the Boogie Down Bronx Runners, located in the same borough where he now works as a child psychiatrist. And it's so meaningful. You could have moved to another neighborhood. Why not? I don't want to work anywhere else. Uh, there's no greater need for, for mental health services, I think, than here. The Bronx is also where Jorge has been training. I once ran 18 miles on this track. Oh my goodness. Isn't that crazy? How many loops around is that? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> he can't wait to run through his hometown borough, which he'll reach during mile 20 of the marathon. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> I think I'm going to cry, Joe. Um, <laughs> I, it's going to be on my mind for the first 19 miles of the race. Can't wait to get to the Bronx, where it all started. Jorge now looks forward to the route ahead, knowing the toughest road is already behind. We've got more inspiring stories on Global Running Day right after the break. the boost. This 70-year-old woman received a special surprise at her very first marathon, her son. 
and he cheered her on in a very special way. NBC's Kate Snow has that story. Susie Weigel decided to run her very first marathon at 70, training for a year. The Minnesota mom of six has been running shorter races for years, all to raise money for her nonprofit, Running for Justice. Its mission, to prevent human trafficking. My whole life I've just watched her uh, like step up and help people. Her son Steve said he'd cheer her on from the Twin Cities Marathon sidelines last month. I had asked him a few times if he wanted to be a part of it, and he goes, no, Mom, I can't. My knees are, you know, my knees are not good. But watch this. On the day of the race, as music blared, Steve walked his mom to the starting line. I kind of want to run it, too. He put down his bag and took off his hoodie, revealing a race bib. He'd be running by his mom's side. <laughs> the surprise overwhelming Susie. <laughs> Day two training, did three miles. Turns out Steve had been secretly training. This is the year she's gonna run a marathon and I'm secretly training to run it with her. It's gonna be a good year. You didn't tell your mom you were training at all? No, no, I told my dad um, because I had to plan some things out to like be able to surprise her in that way. Yeah, it was a huge shock, a good shock. Pretty rough. We're gonna make it. Through 26 grueling miles, together they went the distance. Now 23. Even when Susie's legs started giving out. Come on, Mom, we got this. Mile after mile, Steve lifted her up and cheered her on. Come on, there it is. You're good. Until she finally Incredible. crossed the finish line. I wouldn't have been able to do it, so I just feel like God gave me him to, to run with me, encourage me, and, and help me through that. A family celebrating a woman who's worked so hard to help others, and a son grateful to be there for his marathon mom. I love you and I'm thankful for you. She's taught me a lot about determination, and that determination even comes from a place of like love, which I think is beautiful. Now to the remarkable story of two runners brought together in a dramatic way. One saved the other's life. Take a look. I consider myself a lucky person, but this was Remarkable. <laughs> In the fall of 2019, John Harvey's good fortune was about to be put to the test. A surgeon at New York's Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital, he was on a training run in Central Park. His wife, Helena, was cheering him on at mile 15. He ran by, he gave me a kiss, I gave him the banana, and he went on his way. I walked over to the finish line and I waited and I waited and I waited and he didn't appear. Helena had no idea her husband had collapsed just moments after seeing her. Also out running that day, Sauni Pereira, another physician at Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. I came upon a runner who was collapsed on the side of the running path. I started ventilating the patient. Another police officer arrived with a defibrillator. We put the device on the patient. It noted that we should deliver a shock. We did. His hand landed on his chest. I saw his wedding ring and I immediately thought this guy is married. He probably has kids. My next memory was opening my eyes and looking straight up at the sky with a circle of people looking down at me and looking really excited and happy. Resuscitated, Harvey was rushed to a nearby hospital. He had gone into cardiac arrest. Tests would reveal it was the result of a congenital heart condition and he would ultimately undergo open heart surgery. But there was still a missing piece. He called me and he said, are you, are you the person that helped resuscitate me? And I said, yes, I am. You know, it was, it was as special to me as it maybe was for him. This was the beginning of a really lovely friendship. This weekend, the friends will take on a special challenge, running the New York City Marathon together, step by step. Sauni is very much like a superhero. She's super fast and she saves lives. Sauni is gonna very kindly slow down so that we can run together. Their fortunate friendship extending far beyond Marathon Sunday. I consider myself an extremely lucky person. Being saved after an event like this, it's like winning the lottery, it truly is.
Wow. What a story. And Sony and John are with us this morning. Doctors, good morning to you. Are you guys ready for the marathon? Absolutely. We're ready. We're yeah. excited. What has this meant to you, John, to, to have this friendship and, and form this bond with Sony? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's just such a wonderful thing. And Sony did such an amazing thing that day. And uh, she saved my life. I mean, what more can I say? I'm still here for my family, my patients, and um, and now we have a wonderful friendship as well. And, and Sonia, is it, is it true that you actually weren't even supposed to be out running that day? I wasn't supposed to be running. I was supposed to do a longer run the day before, which I quit early, and then I went out the next day. Even my husband said, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'm just going to run a couple more miles. And that brought me there. And Grateful. You found each other. What did you think when it was John on the other end of the phone saying, hey, did you save my life? You know, making that connection. Yeah, it was incredible. He said, how is it possible that I had a heart attack and an anesthesiologist <laughs> ran by? I mean, it was just meant to be. Yeah, no accidents. On Sunday, I understand you also both running to honor your mothers as well. Yeah. So, John, tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I'm actually raising money for the Susan G. Komen Foundation in honor of my mom. Uh, she's, she passed away this, this year uh, from breast cancer, sadly. She's always been my, li my lifelong greatest supporter. So um, I know that she would want to be there at the race for me uh, this year, but, uh, uh, but I'm raising for this great charity. Coming up, the latest viral video to boost your day. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one more video sure to leave you with a smile. Check it out. The surprises just kept coming for a man in the UK. He was celebrating his 50th birthday. So first, his friends and family surprised him at a restaurant. And then moments later, all of his closest buddies from Italy oh. showed up. Check it out. No. <laughs> 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 All right. That's oh, man, good. you know when you don't expect it. Anyway, here they came, and so came the, 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 the expletives. Yeah, anyway, uh, it meant a lot to this guy. Uh, happy 50th. That's, that was really that's how you know it's real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're bleeping yeah. stuff out, you know it's real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He's moved. And that is it for today. We will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. Learn how to sell your home quicker at asking price, if not higher. Reduce your energy bill. And why you need to think twice about giving out your email. It's all coming your way. But first, a warning about a potential danger for drivers and pedestrians. Ultra bright headlights that can lead to accidents. And what you need to do now to stay safe on the road. Social media is filled with photos and videos of blinding headlights. I can't even see. I'm like literally getting blinded from the guy's headlights behind me.
Watch these close calls apparently caused by the glare. This driver barely misses that pedestrian. Another near collision with an oncoming car. And this crash into a downed tree. The light does look much brighter. John Bolo is a scientist who studies lighting for the Mount Sinai School of Medicine's Light and Health Research Center. He says older headlights use halogen bulbs, which have a softer orange color, but newer ones are bluish white. You're creating a lot of glare for those other drivers. And a potentially dangerous situation. That's right. Bulla showed us the difference firsthand with an older halogen headlamp and a newer LED, both emitting the same amount of light. I'm going to look at the warm light just to kind of get a sense. Okay, yeah, it's bright. Let me see what the LED light does. Oh, this one for sure much, much brighter. It hurts my eyes and actually I'm still seeing the spots from it. Why is it that they appear brighter? Well, our eyes are more sensitive to blue light. He says the issue is magnified when a headlight is out of alignment, a common problem. An NBC News analysis found only 10 states require annual inspections that check to see that headlights are aligned correctly, pointing straight out and down. Bulla shifts an LED headlight out of alignment by just a few degrees to show me what can happen on the road. Wow, so the LEDs are already quite bright, but when they're tilted up, you can't see anything else. This would be very dangerous if I were driving. He says another contributing factor, large trucks and SUVs, which made up 75% of all vehicle sales last year. Those taller vehicles mean headlights are higher and more likely to shine directly into the eyes of a driver in a smaller, lower vehicle. I couldn't see for five to 10 seconds. Aaron Madrid totaled his Chevy Sonic in November when he says an oncoming pickup truck blinded him. By the time I was able to see, I had swerved into incoming traffic and then I ended up in a tree. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt. It just felt like lights out. But Ashanti Collins wasn't so lucky. She says in May 2021, the lights from an oncoming vehicle led to her crash. Was it just totally blinding? Yes, I couldn't see anything. That was the only thing I seen before I woke up on the side of the road in my car. She had to be airlifted to a hospital to treat a broken arm and dislocated wrist. When you looked at the pictures of your car, did you think it was a miracle that you survived that crash? Yes, definitely. Looking at the car, it was just insane. Experts and automakers agree the primary solution to this glaring problem is something called adaptive headlight technology. Right now, it's only available on test vehicles here in the U.S., but I'm going to show you how it works. I'm here in Virginia at the Audi U.S. headquarters to show you what the future of driving at night might look like. Audi's head of product management, Philip Brabeck, what did these lights do? Well, instead of thinking of a static light like a low beam and a high beam, think of it as a projector. There's 1.3 million micro mirrors in each headlight that create this image. And it's not blinding other people. And it's not blinding other people. I get behind the wheel to see for myself. Wow, I can see yep. everything. <laughs> this experience of driving at night is completely different and so much better. I feel like a safer driver. Notice these arrows on the pavement. It's helping you stay within the lanes. As I pull onto the highway, the lights highlight my lane without affecting other drivers. Okay, so this so car- So now he got in. Got in front of me. And notice how it's got a shadow on him now. Yeah. Oh, interesting. But the real light show takes place on this dark, windy road. It almost feels like magic because of the amount of light that is being cast all over. I'm not used to seeing that as a driver. I switch cars so I can see what it's like to drive toward the test car with adaptive headlights. His high beams are on. Yes. But they're but not a problem not. for yep. me. Yep. Whereas this car behind him with the LEDs is quite bright. Yes. It's remarkable to see the difference. Do you think this technology is life-saving? Absolutely. Adaptive headlights have been in use in Europe and several other countries for about a decade now, but automakers and safety experts here say red tape in the United States means it could be years before we see this technology allowed on cars here. So in the meantime, you want to drive slowly at night. Look toward the right-hand edge of the road to avoid glaring lights. And if you suspect your headlights are out of alignment, you can actually check to see if one light is higher than the other when you pull into your garage or point your car towards a wall. Even an inch or two can mean a major mistake misalignment 100 feet down the road. And don't forget to check with your mechanic. They should be able to easily realign your headlights.
It's not just road safety that's become a hot topic. Retailers have also started tightening their refund policies and charging additional fees. This is all according to the National Retail Federation. Americans returned $816 billion worth of merchandise in 2022. So how do we avoid those extra fees? Here's how you can make your returns easier and cheaper. So, Vic, it used to be when you bought something online, you didn't like it. It was a simple, easy return. Yeah. But is that not the case so much anymore? Things are definitely changing, Hoda. Once upon a time, when we were nervous about going yeah. online to buy something, what is this, the Internet shopping? Yeah. Retailers were like, look, we're going to make it so easy for you. We're going to ship it to you for free. You can return it to yeah. us for no yeah. fee. It will be just like going to a brick and mortar. Fast forward 15, 20 years, and yeah. now we are doing that gangbusters. But it's not free to the retailer when you process a return. It's anywhere from right. 15 to $20 minimum. And we talk about 16 and a half percent of all online purchases go back and there's a real cost. And now retailers are trying to claw that back. A recent survey by GoTRG shows 60% of retailers are reconfiguring their return policies in one way or another. Yeah, oh. It did almost feel like they, they did want you to yes. like, go yeah. try it on at home, send Absolutely. it back, sure. no problem. Well, times they are a change in. So what are some of the new rules and pitfalls yeah. we should work out? Okay. For? P B P. It's oh, not well, a thing. It's not a thing. I, I admit to you, it? I am making this up. Pause before purchasing. Yes. Oh. The less you buy, the less you're going to return. This is a good time, though, to check your favorite retailer's return policies because odds are something may have changed. And then when you get that item, if you're not positive you want it, make sure you keep it in original packaging. Try it on without makeup or perfume on mm. because if you return mm. it, it needs to be in sellable condition. So much of these returns ends up in a landfill. So oh. it's wasteful. Even if you oh. get your money back, it's very wasteful and there's a cost to the environment. All that shipping, that carbon footprint of sending you something, That's you boxing point. it up, sending it back. So those are things you need to keep in mind. And if you go to return in store, always bring your ID and your original form of payment. That just helps to expedite Somebody the return. Somebody said wait P one. P Someone said wait one week. If you're going to buy something online that's not urgent. Yeah. Yes. If you look back in your little basket and it's a week later and yeah. it's still there and you need it, then get it. Sometimes but you I get a discount that. too. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you get a coupon I listen to you, Nikki. Yes. I listen I to it. you. Uh -huh. So let's look at the policies of some of the country's largest stores. Okay, let's start with Target. Target allows you 90 days to return almost anything except for electronics. Then it's 30 days. But if you have a Target red card, you have up to 120 days to return. Now, Amazon is the interesting one. It's always mm. been 30 days, free returns, as easy as possible. But you do want to pay attention because there are so many third-party sellers on Amazon yeah. and sometimes their return policies are different. Oh. Also, they're starting to implement, according to the information, a $1 return fee. So if you go to UPS to return something to Amazon, yeah. but there's a Kohl's or a Whole Foods that's closer to you, they will charge you a dollar on that item to return. And finally, Walmart, it's 90 days. In person, uh, in store, same, they have a shorter return window for electronics. But those are the big, big companies and their policies as of now. What about like Nordstrom always had like the best return? You don't like it, you take it back. Do retailers have their own things too? Definitely. Yeah. For example, Zara, $3.95 to return an item. Uh, JCPenney, $8. But if you go to the brick and mortar, as with most retailers, mm. it's usually free mm. if you're not shipping it back to them. Uh, the other thing is loyalty programs. So DSW, which is designed Mm -hmm. shoe warehouse mm -hmm. and H&M if you return an item online uh, b mm. by mail there is a fee but if you're a member of the loyalty program oh. it's free so oh. it really pays to look at the fine print to see if you should sign up but again PBP pause before purchase. Like PBP you know what? up next tips to help you save on your energy bill this summer and later how to protect your online privacy and avoid pitfalls that's all ahead on consumer confidential
We're back with Consumer and Confidential. Summer is here, and that means higher energy bills are also on the way. The good news, there are simple ways to save big on your bills. Well, let's talk about some ways to maximize the efficiency. I mean, I was talking about some of these places in the country on the West Coast hitting the 90s. So yeah. the, when's the last time you checked your air conditioning unit it's, to see if it was clean, no, unclogged, no, right? No. We just let that thing go and go. It needs to be inspected. It needs to be cleaned out. Now is the time before it gets really busy and the summer kicks in. The next thing is think about your thermostat. What do you have next to the thermostat? Is there a TV next to it, a lamp? That thing is giving out heat and it's triggering your thermostat to keep the AC uh, running uh, longer. So make sure you move anything hot away from your thermostat. <gasps> and then we talk about strategic planting. Think about your landscaping. If this is the time to put in some new trees and shrubs, what can you do to shade your air conditioning unit? Just make oh, sure the you're unit. Not, yeah, the unit itself, okay. right? You don't want um, a, a messy bush, though, sure. that's going to drop things onto it. And the other thing is think about the hottest part of your house, the, the part that faces the south and west. If you can plant some trees that will provide shade, that's going to cut down on your AC bill by 10%. Huh. At least. Really? Yeah. Landscaping. It's a huh? big difference, strategic landscaping. So let's go inside now. Let's talk about some ways, some tips to keep the inside of your house a little cooler for less. Fans are your friend. A yeah. fan uses 1 60th the amount of energy as an air conditioning unit. So use it in conjunction with your AC. And every degree that you can keep your AC above 75 degrees, you're saving another 15% on your electricity. You mean ceiling bill. fans? Ceiling fans or even floor fans. Oh, okay. Or table fans. Any kind of fan that can help move the air around. It's not going to cool the air, but it will draw the body heat away from your skin and make you feel cooler. Oh. The other thing that's very simple is to buy some caulking or weather stripping to seal any cracks yeah. that are in your walls. And then if you've got like gaps underneath your door or around your windows, get the weather stripping. It's yeah. a very inexpensive fix at the hardware store. Finally, if you can keep your blinds closed during the hottest parts of the day, you're going to reduce heat gain by 45%, 33% if you keep your drapes closed. So that's a simple one. If you want sunlight, go outside. That's These expensive. things add up. I mean, yeah. between the, you know. Right. Anyway, exactly. okay. I didn't realize this. A lot of electricity companies charge different rates for peak use hours. They really do, and it depends on where you live and the season. So you want to look that up on your energy company's website or give them a call. Generally, between two and six is when you want to avoid using your large appliances, your okay. dishwasher, your washer and dryer. Use it after 6 p.m. or on the weekends. The other thing we don't think about, unplug those little appliances, the chargers, everything that you have plugged in you that call you don't them vampire use. devices yes, they're slowly sucking the juice <laughs> out of the, the electricity system and causing your electric bill to go up those incandescent bulbs think about how many light bulbs you have in your yeah. house lamps in the ceiling switch everything to led not only does an led bulb last 25,000 hours compared to just 1200 hours for an incandescent bulb but those older bulbs they're just emitting heat yeah, they which are also hot. makes your house hotter yeah and they cost three times as much to run all right Bye. so switch to LED. i didn't realize this our water heaters yeah. in our homes are responsible for like a fifth of our bill yeah 18 percent of your mm -hmm. annual energy bill comes from your water heater this is i was going to ask you craig from the last time you remember I what remember degree you you're supposed to set yes, it at and i didn't know then <laughs> i've never and, even looked but at you ours. Do now 120 <laughs> degrees i was going to say 120 degrees perfect right on the money you learned something from the last mm -hmm. segment so the consumer product safety commission says not only is this safer it's going to prevent anybody from being scalded by hot water but it's more energy efficient the other thing only run a full load of laundry i'm sure we know this by now and use cold water unless you have really heavily soiled clothes the last part is use the sun. At least start drying some of your clothes outside. And maybe if you don't like how crispy they get, mm -hmm. throw them in the dryer for the last five or ten minutes to fluff them back up. Okay. But use the sun. Use the outdoors All to help these you. Things to help. So yeah. you know oh. with the credit cards, for example, yeah. you'll say, just call. Just ask for a discount. Apparently with this, maybe you could try that. Is too. that true? Always ask for a discount, no matter where <laughs> and then you they are hang up on the situation. You. No, and this is the thing. Your energy provider has um, programs to help you with income. And that also is true. folks with disabilities yeah. can qualify for some of these programs. The other thing is a lot of companies want to encourage you to weatherize your home, install Energy Star appliances. We bought some uh, light bulbs through Con Ed, which is here in New York, mm -hmm. and the light bulbs were like 25 cents each. So there are programs that can save you up to $500 or more on your energy bill. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. I know. Great tips. Save almost 30% with She's like things. an encyclopedia. We'll take it. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks, Vic. Yep. Coming up, what you need to know to make it harder for advertisers to track you online, plus how to cut down on subscriptions and save more money. We're back right after this.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. Give up your email and get a discount. Well, it sounds simple, but did you know your email is a valuable key to unlocking a lot of personal information? Here's what you should consider before sharing that email. This is a common sight on most websites, pop-up windows asking you to enter your email address to get a discount. But it might not be worth it. Your email connects companies to a treasure trove of information that can stretch back decades. What you read, where you shop, your age, marital status, sexual orientation, medical history, income, even where you've traveled and lived, all pieces of information that come together to reveal your personal profile. I've had my email longer than I've had my phone number. And, and, and that's a reality for a lot of folks. Patrick Jackson is a cybersecurity expert with Disconnect, an online privacy company. Your email address is a lot more valuable than probably people think it is. It may contain your first and last name, your uh, birthday, who you work for, what school you go to. He says as Apple and Google add more ways for you to block apps from tracking you, and as more consumers say no to cookies, not those cookies, these cookies, advertisers and brands are now asking you directly for your email. It's something that consumers really don't, they don't understand that this is really the glue that connects all these pieces of information together. And when you open an email, that can give advertisers even more info about you. Jackson showed me how it works in real time. Okay, so I got an email that says shoe sale. Is that for me? Yep, that's for you. All right, I'm gonna open it. He hit a tracker in this banner advertisement, and the moment I open it, he learns a lot about me. Just from you opening this email, I can get um, your location, uh, which is New York, New York. You're connecting from an iPhone. You're uh, using the Outlook app on your device, the time when you open it, and if you opened it again. Why should I care that you know all that about me? It's not clear that it's happening. It creates this, this beast that we no longer have control over once this data is collected. And where does all that data go? Patrick says it often ends up with so-called data brokers that might collect and sell it to people like Michael Prem, the CEO of Modern Impact, an advertising agency that helps brands target their customers. Prem says some of this data collection helps consumers by giving them a better online experience. What's the benefit to the consumer? The benefit to the consumer is actually receiving ads that enrich or create a better digital experience. There's no way to remove all advertising from our digital ecosystem. But Prem also advocates for consumer privacy and enforcement of privacy laws. The balance then for brands is making sure that they don't breach our privacy, where they don't come across as stalkerish. Do you think there's a world where you can have both? A consumer can protect their data and have their privacy and still have ads and an experience online that is relevant to them? I sure hope so. While it's not perfect, I think the the goal for many smart advertising brands are to continue to enrich that experience, not to hijack it. And it's not just your email, but your phone number too. That allows businesses to text you and target you for ads. And the more your phone number is out there, the greater a chance it could be part of a data breach, which would make you a bigger target for robocalls and spam texts. And just like mailing lists, it can also be hard to keep track of monthly subscriptions. Those can easily add up, but there are some simple steps you can take to trim down your expenses. We all have that list of subscriptions we're paying for from TV and music streaming to meal plans and fitness apps. HBO Max, Netflix, and Hulu, Spotify, I think gym memberships. Charged automatically each month, whether we remember them or not. And as the Wall Street Journal recently reported, they add up. In a 2022 survey, respondents estimated they spent $86 a month on subscriptions. The actual average amount, $219. And it was far more for Lakeisha Mosley. The pandemic really put us all financially in a tizzy. And so I was going through trying to establish a budget. She found a plethora of forgotten subscriptions. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm paying for this and I'm paying for that including a recurring class pass membership that was costing her about $1,000 a year. I could count on one hand the time I signed in, maybe once or twice. Mosley added up over $700 a month in subscription charges. She ended up canceling more than half. Subscribers like her are saying enough is enough. Cancellations for Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, and others rose about 50% in 2022 from the previous year. Are subscriptions one of those easy things to forget about because they're automatic? 
Absolutely. Your subscriptions are so often, they're small amounts. So sometimes we forget about them. $5, $6, $12 a month. And a proposed rule from the Federal Trade Commission would crack down on companies, ordering them to make it as easy to cancel as it was to sign up. They need to tell you how long the trial period goes for, clearly have to tell you by when you have to cancel. The FTC plan is now up for public comment. Meanwhile, there are a variety of apps that can help you keep track of expenses and flag subscriptions you may have forgotten. I realized I was paying for two Netflix accounts and two Spotify accounts. Dustin Hensley used the app Rocket Money to identify duplicate payments and a mystery $300 annual charge that he got refunded. What advice would you give to other consumers having gone through your experience? Pay attention. You get nickel and dime. It's death by a thousand cuts. If you don't want to use another app to track your subscriptions, you can streamline your payments so they are easier to track. For example, use your most used credit or debit card and set up alerts on your phone for when those charges hit. Then you'll see that. You'll be reminded that you are still paying for subscriptions. Still to come, staging your home can pay off getting it off the market quicker and at the price you're asking for or even more. Next, the tricks to make your house a hot property when consumers Consumer Confidential returns. It is a tricky market for home buyers and sellers right now with high mortgage rates causing a dip in sales. But staging your home can make all the difference and the right changes can even get your home sold above asking price. The best part, you don't have to spend a fortune. All the world's a stage, including your home when it's time to sell. With existing home sales down nearly 23% from last year, some homeowners now opting to set the scene for potential buyers, giving their spaces a mini makeover before putting them on the market. We staged the main living areas. We also repainted a lot of walls, but more importantly, massively decluttered the house. From a fresh coat of paint and unobstructed windows to updated furniture and floor coverings, a recent survey finding 81% of buyer's agents said staging made it easier for a buyer to visualize a property as their future home. We sort of have to move the seller out a little bit in order to help the buyer feel like they can move in. Stacy Esser, a real estate agent in New Jersey who runs her own staging company, says most homes don't need a full renovation to attract buyers. Small changes can welcome a big return. Sellers spending an average of $400 to $600 on staging. You've seen it time and again that when you put in a little investment up front, that increases the sales price of the home? Yeah, you will actually sell your house for more money every single time. Esser says staged homes also sell faster. This listing under contract in one weekend for $126,000 above the asking price. And when the average home spent 160 days on the market in his neighborhood, the owner of this home, staged by Esser, says he accepted an offer in less than a month. What is today's buyer looking for? So today's buyer is looking for more flexible spaces, open floor plans, great storage, work at home, places they can work out, and more informal family time spaces. Esser says wherever the eye rests, the sale begins. You really want to help a buyer envision themselves in that space. 
The most important rooms to stage, the living room, the primary bedroom, and the kitchen. So this is a house coming on the market, actually, this weekend. Essert taking us on a tour of this home's dramatic before and after. One of the things that we start with is always to take any heavy window treatments off mm -hmm. and to really just let that sunshine in. This would-be formal living room recently painted a neutral color ahead of its transformation into a more casual, flexible space. Tell me what you did in here. So first of all, I think what we did is we just made the room feel a lot larger and created multiple seating areas in this really large space. What can you do in the kitchen to tidy it up and make it more appealing to buyers? So one of the easiest things we can do is basically help a seller declutter a kitchen. Esther's recipe for a market-ready kitchen? Clear the counters, swap out bulky furniture, and accessorize with pops of color using items you already have in your fridge or pantry. You really jazzed up the kitchen. Yeah, we totally did. It's inexpensive and anybody could do this. These are actual just vegetables. And we like to use this cookbook to make it feel like somebody was just here cooking. And just switching out the table made a big difference. You combine the round table with the pop of white mm -hmm. and it really lightens up the space. And upstairs, Esther's team reverting this den back into a kid's bedroom. Bedrooms help sell houses. When it comes to staging, it's not just what's on the inside that counts. First impressions matter too. Don't forget about the outside. Make sure your home has curb appeal. There should be flowers planted outside. People should trim their hedges. People should make sure that their lawns are taken care of. Simple touches to help prepare your home for showtime. Esther says the best time to sell is when interest rates go down. She encourages you, if you are thinking about selling, to start your decluttering process now. For example, take down the family photos like this. See how much cleaner and clearer it looks? Next, you're gonna wanna remove any drapes to allow some more natural light to shine into those windows. It makes a big difference. And if you have a busy wallpaper, you wanna change that to a neutral color, maybe paint it to liven up and clear out your home. This is all gonna help interested buyers imagine themselves living in your space. That's our time for now. Thanks so much for watching. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. I love the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, Al. how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. Great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest 
of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and and sons, but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he had had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank goodness he did. We like to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. Your boss. Yeah. And I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah, yeah. first of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish, when we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon. But sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. 
I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression, you're here in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Ross and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish? is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is, when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is, don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. 
The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Howie. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh, my gosh. That's a very thick... We call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sounded... That, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. That did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into lox. here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, would, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse-drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own 
smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has th the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Yeah. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Right. And we're gonna lay it onto this, the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably draw a wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay, that's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So, these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. And now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the US. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this.
Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew sweet cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, it's a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. Now we're watching climate change happen right now, and. I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty locks. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for so we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there okay so let's get started I'm, I'm really it. fascinated okay all right I'm excited so we have prepared what do we have maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you these are huge these would have been huge carrots seriously yeah like wow. the size of my forearm but you <laughs> you have you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. this, this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by I'm, smelling yeah. it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> So I'm just going to start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. 
I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba. Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans, right? And you got to drain them. Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's like, it's Bean water. It's bean bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there. Okay. Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we toss them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking, just ah. to sound like. Classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That exactly. does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank um, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. is fantastic. Okay, well, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. Good Wednesday morning. New concerns for the Pope and his health overnight. That's right, he's hospitalized with abdominal surgery. We'll have more. It's June 7th. This is today. Breaking news Pope Francis.